Welcome to the SureDog Radio Network preview for UFC 295, Prohaska versus Pereira. I'm your host, Ben Duffy of SureDog.com. With me, as always, is Keith Schillen, the executive producer of the SureDog Radio Network. Keith, how are you doing today? Sorry about that. That's how excited I am. I, I've got to take myself <laughs> off of mute. Uh, I'm doing good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Uh, we've got a heck of a card ahead of us here. UFC 295. Uh, the UFC's second to last numbered pay-per-view of 2023. It's had a little bit of turnover, a few last minute changes, or at least last couple of weeks changes. Uh, we're obviously going to discuss those as they come up, but considering everything this card's been through, you don't normally lose maybe the top pound for pound fighter in the sport off of a card and have it still feel as loaded as this, I almost feel like I'm loading this question now, but give this grade a letter card. Uh, good grief. Give this yeah. card a letter grade. <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously we got to grade it on a scale being a pay-per-view. Um, it, it's, I'm going to give it a B plus. I mean, it's it's really good. I mean, the, the main event, the co-main event are, are super, super good. Uh, I mean, I'm really intrigued with all four fighters, fan of all four, all, obviously all four are dangerous uh, knockout artists, um, you know, finishers. It's it's UC two ninety five. It's in New York City. It's that one of those you know, there's three or four pay per views a year that are different than all the rest of the pay per views. Like the bigger, yes. the New York City one is supposed to be. Sure. Um, I, I originally was going. I actually sent in and I got approved for my press credentials. I was coming in. Life kind of got in the way, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I won't be able to cover, but we still got it covered. Uh, so I'm a little disappointed, you know, always excited to get you pumped up. You go, you know, after, after weigh in something, you will take a stroll through Times Square and you see, you know, you see the fighters on the, on, on the big screen and it just, it just, everything's bigger in New York. If you've never been to New York city, um, I'm sure there's a couple of listeners who haven't, you got to go at least one time in your lifetime. There's, there's no city in the world like it. Well, uh, and that's coming from a new Englander. Yeah. I mean, shout out to SureDog's John Brannigan, who does a lot of our video post-production. He is from Scotland. He is coming to the United States for the first time, going straight to New York City to cover this card. I believe he's actually in New York by now. And I think New York has more people than literally all of Scotland. (laughs) I I cannot wait to hear his impressions of what it's like. Well, I'm not kidding. You know, I've said before, Dagestan has five and a half million people. Greater Houston has five million. Like, there's a certain scale to the biggest cities, not just in the, in the U.S., but, you know, the biggest international cities against some smaller countries. I'm sure his eyes are just spinning in his head right now. Brannigan, if you're listening to this, I hope you're having a great time this week and yeah. take some time out of your yeah. work to enjoy the atmosphere of what you're jumping into because this is going to, even if the car disappoints, the experience is going to ruin a lot of oh, other yeah. MMA for you. <laughs> oh yeah, and I, I hope he. I mean, it's a beautiful hotel that they. That if they if they're doing the same hotel as they did last year, I was there last year for a week. Beautiful hotel right in Times Square. Uh, you know, obviously Madison Square Garden. It's a special place. Uh, you know, if he goes to the Wayans, enjoy the Wayans, do do all. You know, really take it in. But I hope he gets. I hope he books a couple extra days. You know, go see the Statue of Liberty. Go go to the top of the Empire State Building. Like do it all. Uh, that said, you, well, we're, 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 yeah, I apologize for this going up a day late. That was again on me when I said life gets in the way. Uh, but back to this New York, New York city still needs a New York city personality. That's the one thing it's missing. You know, we talk about these four fighters. I mean, who, you know, are the top four fights, who's, who's got the biggest personality? I mean, probably, probably Aspinall or, or Prohaska, but his, it doesn't come. It's not press conference personality. That's what I'm saying. Like perhaps it's just like samurai, don't say much, kind of scary. Like he's he's like locked in a dark closet right now in New York City. Like he like he must hate New York City. <laughs> you know, like he's, <laughs> you know, uh, like he, he he's doing his training. He like he he took the tea out. Uh, you know, took the train out to. Uh, like as far away from New York City as he can, and he's in like a some park underneath the bridge, like meditating. <laughs> like that's what he's doing right now. <laughs> or, or you, you know what? Knowing him, he probably found a way to get actually into the sewers. And he's like, he's like, he's like a real like 
killing was, alligators with a katana right now. Yeah, yeah he's like a real ninja <laughs> turtle. Oh, what's the what was the what was the rat's name? Um, Splinter. Rats. Splinter, Master yeah, Splinter. yeah. He's like, yep. yeah, he's like doing Master Splinter shit. In, 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 <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Pahea, Pahea has a presence to him that, mm-hmm. that is big, uh, especially when you have a rival like with Adesanya, like that worked. Without the Adesanya, I, I think you, it'll, I think it'll be a little flat. Um, he's still extremely intimidating. Uh, Aspinall, I mean, it, it is what it is. Aspinall is just like another guy. I mean, he's obviously crazy and talented. In Pavlovich has this like Ivan Drago type personality, you know. But you, if somehow we could have just added, you know, Stevie Miritich and John Jones back on this card and, and keep this, I mean, this would be a plus. Yeah, because well, you had to have you'd have John Jones, you'd have you know, greatest fighter of all time, you know, possibly greatest UFC heavyweight of all time in Miatich. I mean. Yeah. And Jones at least is from upstate New York or the Western Plain or whatever they call, you know, uh, the Rochester yeah. area where he comes and, from. And I know what the comments are going to say. The comments are going to say, oh, Aspinall and, and, and Pavlovich is an even better fight. Yeah, I agree. Sure. It is. Sure. You still need that. Like, yeah. my, my, my friends don't care. My casual yeah. friends don't care. But like to them, the the card is sucks now. Yeah, uh, dude, top five UFC lightweights still call Conor McGregor out after a win. It's not because he's the best fighter. Yeah, it's because they want to draw fans yeah. and make money. Uh, I speaking of this, I I've got a question for you. So this card lost three whole fights. Not talking about substitute fights, but lost three whole fights. Uh, Mateusz Rabeski versus Narulo Alayev. Alayev fell out with an injury like three days ago. They have not found a replacement opponent for Rebeski yet unless that replacement opponent is Conor McGregor we'll probably just let that slide and not regroup for a, a, a midweek uh, preview then we lost uh, Roman Delize versus Derek Brunson Brunson left all the way to the PFL so that's how long ago that fight fell apart and then obviously the biggest loss was the intended headliner John Jones versus Stipe Miacic where Jones fell out with a severe pectoral tear on October 25th so the big loss on this card, obviously, is Jones versus Miacic. But say I come to you three weeks ago, and I say, I'm from the future. We're going to lose one of these two fights. We're either going to lose Jones versus Miacic, or we're going to lose Prohaska versus Pereira. I'm not asking you which is the better fight, which is more important, which deserves to be the headliner. Yeah, I'm just saying, which one you look forward to, to more, which fight do you cut from the card? That's a good one. <laughs> That's why you're the best in the business, Ben. Uh, so this this shows you like we don't do any like. <laughs> I jumped on you said, "Hey, you ready to go?" I said, "Yep." <laughs> and you hit record. Surprise. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you can ask me. Uh, if I can only cut one, the the better fight is definitely Prohaska versus Pereira. Yeah, you know, I hated the gimmicky stuff that Bellator did. You know, Hoist Gracie, Ken Shamrock, these, you know, um, Jones, Stipe doesn't, not to that extent, but a little bit of that too. But, but I just think one fight ago, Stipe Mantich was a champion. Now, that was years ago, but it's still only one fight ago. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't New York City, if it was Dallas, if it was Seattle, well, something I, I, I probably keep it. You know what? No, it doesn't matter where it is. John Jones and Stephen Mitch is, is so rare for them to even fight. Never mind fight each other. I still want that fight on the card. I, I, I'd i cut Pajeda and, and Prohaska. That's probably not good, especially not for this show, because this is a hard goal. That's not going to be a popular answer. Yeah, I and I get where you're coming from with that. I would keep Prohaska versus Pereira myself, just because on top of everything else, it, We'll get to it when we get to it, but there's no way that fight sucks. No, like oh, I'm yeah. just buzzing over the possibilities of what happens there. But sure, I, Jones is the UFC heavyweight champ. Miacic is arguably the greatest UFC, like most accomplished UFC heavyweight of all time, probably in the top three or four most accomplished MMA heavyweights of all time. But if you tell me that Sergey Pavlovich and Tom Aspinall are the two best heavyweights on the planet right now, I might not agree, but I'm not going to laugh at you. Yeah, yeah, totally. totally. They're in a club. They're in a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Any other general thoughts about this card before we dive into the undercard? 
Yeah, the, the the one thing that really jumps out to me is, you know, it, it tends to fall. Like, it feels like it's missing that third fight, like that third big one, uh, um, you know, to make it a perfect, especially for like a card that's supposed to be over overstacked. Mm-hmm. But what I what I do love and, and and, you know, maybe we'll do some of this guessing the odds. There's 12 fights. I don't know who the favorite is in about, I don't know. 11 of them. <laughs> well, like, I have no idea. Like, like, you know, the, the, the heavyweight, I have no idea who the favorite is. The, the, the main event, I have no idea. I'm gonna, we'll, we'll get to that when we, when we get to that, but there's a certain segment of our listener base that enjoys when I quiz you on the odds. I am going to do that on every fight on this card, all 12 fights, <laughs> because I'm genuinely Shit, curious to see how you do. Cause I didn't do that well, so I'm I'm excited for that part. <laughs> you know what? Wait till wait till ESPN uh, fires uh, uh, the Greek guy there, and, and somehow I get the job, and then I got to pretend like I'm some like gambling expert and be like, "What are you talking about? This guy doesn't even look at the gambling lines." And all of a sudden, I'd be like, "Ah, you know the sharp." I, I said, "Get all the language, all the sharps." You know, I got to sprinkle here. <laughs> Maybe just be minty bets. Wear something really, really tight and say shit that's wrong. <laughs> like. T- <laughs> Have you seen me? Ben? I think all my clothes are today. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the, hey, the holidays are coming. Dude, and I have I've told you before, right off the bat, when we have UFC cards where, dude, more than half the fights have a greater than two to one favorite in them. There's four fights on this card with at least a four to one favorite on them. This one, there are 12 fights on this card. Nine of them, the line is closer than minus 200. Okay, that's good. This is UFC 295, pick them and pray, is, yeah. is what I'm calling this one. Uh, should we jump in? Yeah, let's do it. All right. First up at UFC 295, at least as the card is constituted as of the beginning of fight week, is a featherweight contest between Dennis Bazookia and Jamal Emers. Bazookia, the 26-year-old New Yorker, is 11-3 and overall. He is 0-1 since joining the UFC as a two-time veteran of Dana White's Contender Series. He lost on Season 4, then won on Season 6, and was not signed despite winning. Finally got the call-up as a short-notice replacement opponent for Sean Woodson back in August at UFC on ESPN, Sandhagen versus Font, where he dropped a unanimous decision. He will look to get into the win column against Emmers. 34-year-old Californian is 19-7 and seven overall. He is 2-3 and three in the UFC, having alternated wins and losses ever since his debut uh, about three and a half years ago. He is coming into this fight off a loss. He dropped a split decision to Jack Jenkins at the Emmett versus Tapuria card back in June. Odds here? Your favorite is minus 250. Your underdog is plus 200. Keith, who are they? So this is the, the I said the one fight that I don't know who the favorite is. I, I, you know, I said there's one fight I don't know who the favorite is. This is the one fight I'm confident that I know the favorite is. Uh, I, Jamal Emers is, is, is the favorite. You are correct. Emers is minus 250. Incidentally, that makes him the biggest favorite on the card as of right now. This thing yeah. is tight. I, I, uh, I think he should be. Yeah, Emmer's minus two fifty, Bazookia plus uh, two hundred. Keith, tell me who you think wins this one and how. Yeah, I think I kind of just uh, you know showed my showed my cards there when I said that I think he should be. Uh, I, I've always thought Emmer's is pretty good. Like he, yeah, you know, he doesn't have the best record in the UFC, but he's kind of had a, you know a tough schedule. <laughs> you know, uh, he's huge for the weight class, good volume, quick hands. He's got long and lengthy, you know, strikes. You can, you know, you can strike from distance. He's accurate, good jab. I love that he follows up with his a nice straight right. I love that he rips the body. He's got mean kicks to the body. Uh, I love that he throws a lot of step in knees. He does avoid stri- st- uh, avoid strikes by backing straight up, which which you know I hate. Uh, he he does do well to use his size though to, to close the distance, get in the clinch, grind on his opponents. He can use his big frame and kind of blast the body with knees. Always thought he's a very underrated wrestler. Chain wrestles well together. Good at winning scrambles. Um, Jack Jenkins. I thought he beat Jack Jenkins. I mean, it was a split decision. It is what it is. It was a very close fight. But uh, you know, he he controlled Jack Jenkins on the ground really well. He did stall, which was surprising. Like on on top, uh, but he is also a submission threat. Now move over to Bazooka. He's only twenty six, so I like that. He's got some good experience on the regional scene. Uh, 
the fights with a lot of pressure. You know, he's going to want to march forward. He's a pocket boxer. He, he, you know, he fights behind a high guard, steps in the pocket, step really steps into his shots. He can make the mistake of trying to land the perfect blow, which kind of leaves him to be countered. Uh, but I like that he rips the body. He doesn't check leg kicks, though. Going back to his, his UFC debut against Sean Woodson, Sean Woodson was destroying his legs early on with calf kicks. Uh, he does like to battle in the clinch, but he's definitely not a wrestler, and he's, he's, a, he's a weak defensive wrestler. I mean, he got out wrestled by Sean Woodson, who is a boxer. So you know, no, no, no. He's he's awkward. I mean, he's long, lengthy. He's he's an awkward guy for anybody. But but still, it, you know, it, it isn't good to be out wrestled by a, a boxer. And he struggled to get back to his feet. But in fairness, you know, we, we mentioned he, he he didn't have a camp for that fight. He took the fight in four days' notice. It's his UFC debut. So you give him a little bit of a pass on that. Uh, and he has good cardio. So he you know he can go hard all fifteen minutes. But but I'm 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 I agree with the betting lines. Like I, I'd be very surprised if if Emers loses this. I, I'm all over Emers here. I, I think he's better than Bazooka everywhere. I think he's bigger. He's stronger. He's well, I know he's bigger. <laughs> I shouldn't say I think he's bigger. I know he's bigger. <laughs> if somehow he shrunk, uh, that'd be very surprising. <laughs> but uh, he, yeah, he's stronger. He's faster. He's the better wrestler. Bazooka showed how tough he is. I mean, you know, against Sean Woodson, that's not an easy out for anybody, even with the camp. Never mind coming in and you know days notice. So I think he makes it to the distance, but I expect this to be just one way traffic. Give me Emmers by decision. Yeah, I wish I could offer a little more intrigue to our listeners, but uh, I, I'm all over that pick as well. I'm glad that Dennis Bazuki made it to the UFC. Uh, I'm he. It is a little surprising that he's still just 26. He's got the feel of a guy that's like 33 and has been fighting local shows out of Longo Weidman for, you know, a million years, but he's not, he, he is of prospect age and he actually was a better fighter, you know, from his first appearance on the contender series three years ago to his second appearance to his, uh, you know, CFFC fight right before the Woodson fight. So he, he is still improving. There's going to be a hard cap. Uh, he is a modest athlete at best, uh, but the kind of fighter he is at, at best, where he is a come forward striker who does put pressure on his opponents when he throws enough volume and he's not facing someone who can make him pay with uh, reactive takedowns or just counter him. Uh, he is a good fighter. He's a, a kind the kind of gritty guy that would might stick around the UFC for a long time. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, this is, Dennis Pazuki is 14th UFC fight and he's, you know, eight and six, and he's got a couple of fight of the night awards. He could be that kind of guy, but not if he gets dusted by Emmers. And I'm kind of worried that's what's going to happen. He, I give him a pass on the Woodson fight. All things considered, he looked pretty good. Uh, Woodson's a dangerous guy and Bazuki came in. I, I don't know if anyone will remember this, but Bazuki was Woodson's fourth opponent for that fight. They were just, flipping them like just flipping cards you know uh, in a, you know in a game of poker and yeah he, he toughed it out he didn't make adjustments from round to round like you wish he, he would have but here i think this is an even worse matchup for him than woodson was because emers is a very good boxer while he's not as huge as woodson he is going to have reach on bazookia he throws more volume he throws more power he has longer reach he's a much better wrestler yeah, they're just not going to be any safe places for Dennis Bazuki here. I'm with you. I think this makes it to the final horn, but very much one-way traffic, and I think Bazuki is going to look like he's been hit by a truck by the end of it. Uh, give me Emmers by decision as well. Next up on the UFC 295 undercard is a men's flyweight matchup between Josh Van and Kevin Borjas. Van, the 22-year-old Houston native, is 8-1 and one overall, he is 1-0 in the UFC. He made a short notice debut uh, back in June at UFC on ABC Emmett versus Taporia, taking a split decision over Zhalga Zhumagulov. He'll look to make it 2-0 against Borjas. Borjas, the 25-year-old Peruvian, is 9-1 as a professional. This will be his UFC debut. He competed on the Contender Series back in August, taking a unanimous decision over Victor Diaz. Odds here, this is another of the three fights on the card with a greater than two to one favorite. The favorite is minus 225, underdog around plus 185. Keith, who are they? Um, 
Man, I, I'll say Van is the favorite, but I disagree with that. I think this should be a much closer line. All right, you are correct, and you are two and zero on the card so far. Van is minus two twenty five, <laughs> Forhouse plus one eighty five. Uh, I'm still going to go under under five hundred. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, these two were actually supposed to fight on the Contender Series. They were scheduled to fight back in August. Van got drafted up to fight. Uh, Juma Gulov, and they found another opponent for for Borja. So this is remaking a fight that was supposed to take place earlier this year anyway. There are some things that I really, really like about Josh Van, and there are some things that are concerning. At, at 22, uh, the the offensive skill set he has, and the first thing I, that should really be out of my mouth is that this guy is an athlete with a capital A. He is blisteringly fast, coordinated, smooth, and it's all being put in the pursuit of offense for the most part. Uh, I see a lot in this game, not an exact correspondence of skill for skill, but the general approach and some of the skills makes me think of a flyweight Terrence McKinney because you don't see many 22-year-olds that have head kick knockouts and calf cutter submissions and, oh, they nail almost all their opponents with at least one flying knee. He has the like the full set of quick finishing techniques, both on the feet and on the ground. Uh, but he has some of the habits that you see, that fighters seem to develop when they're able to overwhelm opponents with athleticism and aggression on the regional scene. And it's an open question whether uh, he'll be able to develop a second line of offense against fighters that don't just go away. It was good to see him uh, go all three rounds against Juma Gulov, a guy that, uh, well, the unluckiest man in the UFC, <laughs> lucky only in love, uh, you know, but a tough guy and, and a tough out for anybody. It was good to see Van still there against a fighter who was, you know, still there for him and, and presented those kind of challenges. Uh, Van, obviously he's from my town. I make no you know secret that I I follow those prospects from you know generally from before they they make a national splash and I've been interested in seeing his development and even though he won his UFC debut and even though he is a big favorite here there is something about him that makes me think of when Mana Martinez got the call up where Martinez had the dazzling highlights as an offensive fighter but had some obvious flaws that now that he's up in the UFC, he was going to have to deal with on the biggest stage under the brightest lights. Like, you know, Mana Martinez obviously is a fantastic kickboxer with rare power for a bantamweight, but susceptible to wrestling, could be taken down, could be held down, and did not respond well to pressure. And that's been his problem ever since he's been in the UFC. Uh, it's I'm concerned that a bigger, stronger fighter who doesn't just go away when van blitzism is going to make him pay uh borjas might be that guy borjas is a good fighter um you know i think he is a little bigger naturally than van he has good power he doesn't i, I mean not many flyweights do have one shot lights out power but he has very much has plus power for uh you know for a flyweight van has the more impressive highlight reel but if you're just talking about when you're landing bread and butter one twos and, and leg kicks, Boras might have the power advantage. Like Van knocks people out when he does flying knees and head kicks and stuff, but uh Borjas has plenty of power. He's a much more buttoned up uh striker than Van is. And while I don't see him turn to offensive wrestling very often, he seems perfectly happy when fights go to the ground. Uh he's not a fish out of water down there. So I think if Van beats Borjas, this is going to be his best win as a professional so far. He had some good wins in Fury here in Houston. Jumagulov is an underratedly tough win, but Borjas is the real deal, and I'm with you. I think this fight should be like a pick -em. I'm going with Van to win two rounds out of three, maybe have to hold on, uh, you know, against a Borjas who's starting to kind of gather momentum and roll downhill on him as the fight goes on. But I am interested to see how Van does if Borjas takes him down. Um, you know, Van is great in scrambles. Not as comfortable when he's just plunked on his back and having to work from guard to try to sweep or get back up. So I'm expecting a Van decision win here that 
leaves as many questions as it answers. I'm hoping for a performance out of both guys that you know teaches me a little more about Josh Van's progress and allows Borjas to show that he does belong here even in defeat. Yeah, um, yeah, this is a good fight. I mean, it's it's definitely an action fight. Uh, I'll say that the, you know, Van being twenty two, you know, you know, I love that. He, he, you mentioned it. He's extremely athletic. Uh, has already has killer instincts. I mean, he's got tons of ton of finishes. Is it any? Uh, he's a Daniel Pineda protege. Can't you tell just from like the killer <laughs> yeah. instinct? Yeah, yeah. Not, not, a, not a bad guy to follow. Uh, yeah, he, he fights with a lot of pressure. He. He's much better moving forward and then being pushed onto his back foot, uh, which I mean, most guys are, but he definitely wants to be the one marching forward. He, he's a good striker. I mean, he sets up his shots well with feints, good volume, works behind a crisp jab. He he follows through, you know, with basic one-two combinations. Uh, nice snap on his shots, though he, he tends to load up a little bit, too much for my liking. Uh, he likes to throw a lot of teep kicks. Uh, he throws. He throws also a lot of kicks, but he throws a lot of naked kicks, which is which is concerning. Uh, something that at his age he can hopefully uh, clean up. Uh, I love that he throws step in knees. Underrated wrestler. Uh, some, some pretty solid takedown defense too. Uh, even even when taken down, he, he does well to get back to his feet. Uh, I've seen some good ground and pound. Uh, he showed a good get up game on, on the bottom against uh, Zumba Golov. I should have mentioned uh, ending his debut. Uh, he only has two submission wins. Uh, I'd like to see that a little bit more. Uh, Boas, you know, he's he's a younger fighter too. Aggressive, very aggressive on the feet, but he's like a pressure counter striker. Like he's going to move forward. He's going to try to slip and rip. Uh, quick hands, very accurate too. Uh, I love his right hand. Uh, it's a really short, clean shot. He throws really hard. Uh, he also throws some step in knees. Not a not. The best defensively, like he's one of these guys, he's willing to eat a shot to land like a bomb of his own. And he can sometimes overthrow, lead him open to counters. Uh, he also doesn't check leg kicks. Uh, not much of an offensive wrestler, and he's a weak defensive wrestler uh, and struggles to get off the bottom. But he's got good cardio. Like He's going to keep coming the whole hard all 15 minutes. I, I think, this, like I mentioned, I think this is a really good action fight that um, – both guys can throw down. Both guys have good volume. Uh, they both have good cardio. Uh, they're both young, you know. Um, I'm still going to lean Van. Um, he is still the younger of the two, although I don't, I don't really think the age would be much of a factor in this one. But, uh, you know, he he's so athletic, so he can make – I'm hoping to see more improvements, jumps. He's already, he's already, already have that UFC debut under his belt which is always a good thing. And he, I think he's got the better overall wrestler. Like he could maybe go to that at times and win close rounds. So give me Van. I'll take him by decision. You know what? Another thing is the rules about this card, Keith. What? Out of 12 fights, there are only two fights at light heavyweight or higher. And they're basically the two best fights you could yeah. possibly imagine. So yeah. we get no, there's not going to be any. Those slapping titties. No, no slapping titties. No, just unskilled uh, light heavyweights gassing out with yeah. you know, staggering out with their hands on on their knees. It, this, I mean, there's not even a welterweight or a middleweight fight. This entire card is 155 and below, yeah, except for the top two fights. Uh, yeah, you gotta like that. Yeah, I, I do, and I like the fight that's up next. It is a men's bantamweight matchup between John Castaneda and Kyung Ho Kong. I'm going to say that the nicknames Sexy Mexi versus Mr. Perfect sounds very professional wrestling. That's okay with me. Uh, uh, you know, just as long as I get some action. It's still it's still real to me, damn it. Uh, Castaneda, the 31-year-old fighting out of Minnesota, is 20-6 and six overall. He is 3-2 and two in the UFC. He's coming in off of a win. He fought back in June at UFC on ESPN, Cara France versus Albazi where he took a unanimous decision over Muin Gafarov. Uh, he'll look to make it two in a row against Kong. The 36-year-old Korean is 19-9 and nine with one no contest overall. He is 8-3 and three with one no contest in the UFC. He is on a two-fight win streak, dating all the way back to the middle of 2022. He comes in off of back-to-back -back wins over 
uh, Batgari Dana and Christian Quinones. The most recent of those, the Quinones fight, was in June at UFC on ESPN, Vittori versus Cannoneer. Odds on this fight, your favorite is minus 140. Your underdog is plus 115. Who are they, Keith? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I'll say Castaneda is the favorite. Keith is three for three on this card so far. You are correct, sir. Sexy Maxi, minus 140. Mr. Perfect, plus 115. Tell me who you think wins this one and how. You know, the fans will will win if if Kang, he, in, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, uh, just goes straight in on on the character of Mr. Perfect. Like, he should come out with the entrance, Mr. Perfect. Come out with, like, a, gre- like a greasy mullet. <laughs> And then no, it's not like the towel. I had the towel, throw the towel behind yeah. his back. <laughs> you know, chewing gum, chewing gum, and then spit yep. in the air and hit it. Yeah. Um, which I still do, like like thirty years after <laughs> last seeing Kurt Henning, I'll still be outside and just spit my gum in the air and hit it with my hand, just pretend to be Mister Perfect. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm glad the line is close. You know, I, to me, it like, probably shouldn't even be a favorite. Uh, Kang is, I mean, he's a big Bantamite. He's a big guy. He's a counter striker, works playing a good jab. He showed a lot of power in, in his scrap against uh, Christian Quinones. Uh, and that's because he, he sits on his punches. He doesn't check kicks, which is a problem. Uh, but he throws a lot of kicks. He loves his high kick. Uh, he, he can wrestle. He'll shoot for a takedown uh, when being pressured. Strong top control. Uh, he looks to increase position one inch at a time, but very, um, very gelatin Almeida type, you know, style. Uh, he's a sub threat. I mean, hit Quinones with a really slick uh, back take and sub. He has eleven subs on his record. A like, good sub defense. I mean, he wasn't sub by um, Hani Yaya, even though they fought in for like twelve minutes on the ground. So that's that's really impressive. Uh, Canada. He's a southpaw. He's he's also a long and lengthy guy. High volume, throws straight shots down the pipe. I, I love his straight left, uh, short tight shots. Not a lot of tells. He's got serious power. I mean he, I, I mean he knocked out Eddie Wineland, which is not a big deal, but he, he hurt Miles Johns. He hurt Daniel Santos. He hurt uh, Moon Grafarov. Uh, good body kicks. Beautiful high kick. Quick. No tells on that. Uh, he he does. He definitely wants to work from space. He hated when he was pressured against Daniel Santos. He's an underrated wrestler himself. He, he got three takedowns in each of his last two fights. Good at winning scrambles. He's got seven subs himself. Uh, one concern I have, you know, recently, though he's been on a nice run, was he did gas a little against Daniel Santos, so that's concerning. This is a great scrap. Like, I like both guys. I think both guys are, are really underrated. Um, I hope we get some scrambles on them on the ground because I I, I think they're both really good grapplers and 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 uh, you know both guys have looked so good recently like they were guys who came in the UFC that I was really high on but now like they've just showed uh, a lot of skills that I didn't think they possessed. Man, I'm 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 really torn on this one. Um, I'm gonna go with Casaneda because he hits a little harder. Uh, I think he's probably the better overall wrestler. So I'll take. Castaneda by unanimous decision. Uh, you know, I'll see Castaneda by split decision. That's how, like, lack of confidence I have in this one. Yeah, this is a great fight. I'm I'm very reluctant to throw out any predictions for what's going to win fight of the night because, one, the first 10 fights on this card are all pretty exciting on paper, and then the top two are those rare headliner I, and co-headliner that actually might deserve it. Yeah. If they win, it, so. I'll give you one though. I'll give you one later on the card. Okay, I, I look forward to out. it. When I when I think of fight of the night, this one just jumps out at me. So I'll give you one. <clears throat> but here, I mean, I I like your breakdown uh, of these two, and I agree that th- they're this far down the card, and it's kind of this unheralded a fight is more a commentary on the men's bantamweight division, which is just really really difficult to make a splash unless you're a Sean O'Malley type where you have a highlight reel and an oversized personality. Uh, Kong, I mean, he's one of the more mellow high level Korean fighters uh, 
I, I you know I, I can think of, and it's even more remarkable considering he comes from Busan Team Mad, which is the craziest of the crazy camps in Korea. I mean, that's the one where you know Ryo Chonan, Dong Hyun Kim, Do Ho Choi have all come from. Uh, you know. Like, I'm surprised they don't call him Mr. Sleepy, you know, like when he's at the gym. <laughs> but by normal standards, he's a pretty aggressive guy. Uh, I, I like your breakdown of his skills. And he's developed power since being in the UFC. And part of it is just that he's aged. He's been in the UFC for a long time now. He's aged from, I, yeah, from like his mid 20, late 20s into his mid 30s. And a lot of fighters uh, just develop more power at that point. He, you mentioned he started sitting down on his uh, on his punches more. Uh, it's deceptive. You look at his record; he's got 19 wins and 12 are by submission. But you know, a, he was a submission machine in Asia on the way up. Uh, at the UFC level, he's perfectly happy to kickbox it out and just have a a fun, high paced kickboxing match and trust himself to come out on the right side of it. Uh, he's certainly fine if things go to the ground. He choked out Christian Quinones in his last fight. But uh, he's rarely the guy forcing that issue these days. Uh, he certainly isn't the kind of guy you're going to see sliding for like Lux against Castaneda. I, I think it, unless he just does a reactive takedown as a change of pace because Castaneda is barreling forward at him, I think this fight probably goes to the ground or you know someone tries to bring it to the ground only if it's Castaneda who, who wants it there. Uh, but I'm going to go the other way here and take the slight upset. I think Kyung Ho Kong's striking style is likely to play well with the judges unless Castaneda really hurts him. Like if they're just exchanging and the strike numbers are fairly even, I think uh, Kong is the guy that's going to look like he's winning the round. And if it turns into a higher paced scrap, he's the guy I trust to be more at his best in the third round. Uh, he's shown that he can fight any fight at any pace for 15 minutes and he's good where Castaneda I'm a little more worried about it um so give me Kong in the slight upset here uh by decision we head now to the lightweight division for a matchup between Jared Gordon and Mark Madsen Gordon the 35 year old New Yorker fighting out of South Florida is 19 and 6 with one no contest overall he is 7 and 5 with one no contest in the UFC more pertinently, he is two and two with one no contest since uh, moving up to lightweight from featherweight. That no contest was in his last appearance. Uh, he was scheduled to fight Bobby Green back in April. There was a clash of heads late in the first round that rendered the fight a no contest. Not much noise was made about rebooking it, and both men have gone their separate ways. Green has already fought again. Gordon is about to fight Madsen. Prior to that, uh, Gordon had lost a contentious unanimous decision to Patty Pimblett last December that a lot of observers thought Gordon had actually won. So it was the kind of performance that actually raised his stock even in defeat. But uh, here he gets the appearance on one of the UFC's biggest cards of the year against Madsen. The 39-year-old from Denmark is 12-1 and overall. He is 4-1 and in the UFC. That is the good news. The bad news is that the one loss was in his most recent appearance. He last fought back in November of 2022, getting choked out in the third round by Grant Dawson. He will look to bounce back from the first loss of his professional career, even as uh, he pushes towards his 40th birthday. The odds, uh, your favorite is at minus 180, your underdog plus 150. Keith, who are they? Man, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna say, oh shit! I don't. I'll, I'll say Madsen is a favorite. Keith's perfect record is gone, <laughs> just like Mark O. Madsen's. Oh. Uh, your favorite is Jared Gordon at minus wow. 180. Your uh, underdog, Mark O. Madsen, at plus 150. Keith, you can bounce back from that defeat and keep your uh, perfect record on these picks. Uh, the way yeah. it is, however, by, by getting this one right. Uh, who wins this one, and what does the fight look like? <laughs> what I should have did was just check the odds and just be like, you know what, man? I'm going to pick the favorite, and I'm, uh, I'm going to guess the odds and just be saying like, <laughs> the whole night, just perfect all the way through. See, if, 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 if I or anybody watching this thought you would actually cheat like that, it wouldn't be a fun segment. But I have... <laughs> 
<laughs> like I, I know that you would rather be wrong at this than cheat. Yeah. yeah so yeah. 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 Uh, Cause it's not a betting show. Like, uh, yeah. like, like if you bet, you follow my pick and you bet shame on you. Like <laughs> don't, don't be, don't get mad at me. Cause you bet. I, I, mean, I remember, I remember I was uh, a quick story time with Keith. Uh, I embarrassed my wife. Uh, I was playing blackjack. I'm just like a casual blackjack player. I'm not playing. So I'm at like the, I'm at, uh, I think I was at Foxwoods. We were going to a comedy show, seeing my, seeing my favorite com- comedian, Brian Regan. Uh, and we're playing cards, uh, you know, we're at like the $5 tables or the $10 table, whatever, whatever the cheapest table is. Like we're just, we're just playing, like, you know. And this, this guy's like, laying like huge money like 700 bucks and shit i'm like what do you do first of all what are you doing at this table like go go if you want to be a ball go over there so uh uh, the deal in it i don't know what i did i like you know you hit when you're not supposed to hit or you don't hit or whatever which made him get a bad card and then a guy like i complained and it was like there was just me and him at the table there's nobody else like my wife didn't want to play she just sit there like drinking like a sangria and like you know, trying to be like that, like the woman, like cheering on her husband, kind of thing. Sure, your good luck charm. Yeah, yeah. And the guy's like, "Oh, you, you cost me seven hundred bucks." And I go, I turned to him, I go, "I didn't cost you shit. You don't want to put that money down. I didn't, like, I didn't." And he goes, "Oh, you know what you're doing." I go, "Well, go play with the, the big." I'm like, "Go play with the big guys over there if you're such a baller. Stop hanging out at the ten dollar tables." And then the <laughs> dealer, who by the way was like a freaking ten, like ten year old kid. I don't know. He's probably like. Yeah, twenty years old. He's like, all right, guys, all right, guys. Like, we don't have any issues over there. <laughs> and then the guy like got like stomped off and left. And the guy and then the kid was like, what a dick. Like saying to him, like, <laughs> like, hey, dude, like, you want to be betting like paychecks? Well, then go do it with people. What they're doing? Yeah, I- I'm literally wasting time before a show. I couldn't care less if I win or lose. At least he didn't accuse you of like counting cards or something. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> uh. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, that was Dana White, by the way. So, oh. <laughs> so you were filming, and then you you turned off the camera real quick once you realized that it was a side piece with him and not his wife, kind of like Colby <laughs> Covington did a couple years yeah. ago. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, that was <laughs> yeah, fucking Colby. What a fucking joke. <laughs> um. Shit, I forgot what fuck. Oh, Marco Madsen. <laughs> Uh, Jared Gordon, <laughs> yeah. Jared Gordon, Marco and I gotta find. I'm uh, okay. Uh, Jared Gordon. Uh, so I'm gonna read the same notes I had of his last fight. I mean, his last fight ended super early, you know, yeah. controversy. So like, what was I gonna really learn differently about him in that little bit of time? He, he's a minus athlete, but he always makes up with his output. He he doesn't have, he doesn't have like, he doesn't have many holes in his game, but he also doesn't have many things that jump out to him. Like when I think of it, like a, like a like just a fighter. You know, like the if he was a basketball player, he's like the not the first guy off the bench, but like the third or fourth guy. You mm-hmm. know, like the you know he's 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 not playing in the fourth quarter, but he you know he's getting his minutes and like you know right before the fourth quarter starts or something like that. You know, he's getting some minutes right before halftime or something. That, that's to me, a Jared. Gordon. Now that's not, that's not insulting. I'm just he is what he is. Uh, he's he's technical. He's 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 a he's a Got a very boxing style. He keeps everything inside. He he just he isn't a good enough athlete to be very dangerous to be really be a finisher. He's not very explosive. Uh, he has some defensive holes. He drops his hands. Uh, he pills a little. But again, like there's nothing glaring about him that's that's bad. Uh, he can grind grind in the clinch. We saw that against Patty Pimlet. I think he's a little bit of an underrated wrestler. Uh, I was impressed. Like going back to the Chris Fishgold, where he out wrestled Chris Fishgold. Uh, he's 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 a grappler, but he's you know he's not. Like I'm, 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 I think he's probably like a BJJ black belt, but like that means that means nothing to me anymore. <laughs> like you know, everybody's black belt, but uh, but yeah, you know, he's 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 a good grappler. Like he's good, he can control on the ground. He's got some pretty good, you know, ground and pound. He can he can go hard for 15 minutes. Uh, Marco Metzen, he he lands more on the feet than you expect, and I think some of that is because of his wrestling chops. You know, like they're they're more worried about takedowns. Uh, he he likes to brawl. And, and that's because he's just he's a good athlete. Like he's pretty good at it. Uh, he has natural power. Um, he he loves his overhand right. He has some defensive flaws. He he turtle up when he strikes. Uh, he has been cracked a a lot 
Yeah, you know, and he's been hurt. I mean, like Austin Hubbard really was was piecing him up. He he, for a guy who's such a, I mean, he's a Greco Roman wrestler. He was in the Olympics. I mean, he's he's an elite wrestler. I mean, he's, he was silver medalist in the Olympics. Um, but I I want to remind people, the dude is almost forty years old. He isn't close to the wrestler he once was. You know, so like when people, I hate when people like they'll make an excuse. Oh, he got taken down with this guy. Like how good it was wrestling. Like. What is then a wrestling match? It's it, it, which the rules are different and all that, but but also just this is this is the shell of his old self. Uh, he does have some fast entries. Uh, his hip, hip control is off the charts, and that's Greco Roman style. Uh, he gets an angle, and he's so good at just loading up his opponent on his hips and sending him flying, uh, showing his strength. Um, we've seen him do suplexes and stuff. He's got inside trips, but be. I've said this before, but because he comes from a Greco-Roman style, and and I know not not all our listeners know what that means. Greco-Roman wrestling is all up a body where you almost your legs don't exist. Like you can't to grab legs, you can't touch each other. Like you can't use your legs to grab the touch their legs. Um, because of that, he doesn't have to defend leg attacks. You know, when someone's shooting his hip, you just, that's something you do in Greco-Roman. You know, so he, he struggles a little bit there uh, more than if it was a freestyle or folk style wrestler. Uh, once he hits the ground, he's a traditional wrestler looking for those like those head attacks. Uh, we saw him attacking like Darce Chokes. And uh, I, one fight I love that he had this like modified power half Nelson thing going on. Uh, he, he still needs to learn the sub game and he, he isn't, you know, an overall submission threat. And due to his age, his cardio has faded. I mean, he he, he gassed you know badly against Austin Hubbard. You know, in in being that he's, I think he's what did you say, thirty nine? He's thirty. 40? I mean, he only 39. turned thirty nine in September, so he's on the okay. young side oh, of thirty nine. Okay. But all right, all right, so he's thirty nine. Yeah, I thought I, I thought I was gonna say forty, but I thought he was forty. But okay, um, I thought I was. You know, I hate picking against wrestlers, especially high level wrestlers. I just I hate doing it. I have such a high respect for the sport. I, I think it's the hardest sport in the world to to be the best at. I, I think it's much easier to be the best in in MMA than it is to be the best in wrestling. And and I know people who don't say, oh, "How could that be?" You know, there's so many styles. I, I get it, but it, generally speaking, the best wrestlers don't come to MMA. They wrestle like John Burroughs for as far as they their athletic ability can take them, or someone like Kale Sanderson, or or I mean, John Smith a little bit in between, but. Like uh, uh, Kyle Dake, <laughs> you know, they just don't come. They they either wrestle for a really long time, or they you know they start coaching, they're doing clinics, they they go go into commentating, whatever. So I don't know why I this little side rant, but Matson is just simply too old. I, I I think he got in the sport too old. I think he might win the first round. I think he might get some takedowns. He might land some power shots. Um, maybe lands the harder shots and the exchanges, but I think he's going to slowly fade. And I think Gordon's going to take over with volume. And I think Gordon is going like, it's going to look a lot like the Hubbard fight where he's really slowing down. And I actually think Gordon might catch him with something, might hurt him on the feet, might drop him, may jump on it like a guillotine or something. And I say he subs him in the third round. So I thought I had a trendy upset pick, but I guess I'm taking the fear. I'll take Jared Gordon by third round sub. Yeah, I I like the the breakdown there, and you know what? On one level, you talked about the dynamic with high level wrestlers and why we see so few of the elite of the elite of the elite cross over to MMA, especially anywhere close to their prime. Uh, and and side of direction, and they make more money. Yeah, and they make more not, money. Not, not uh, wrestling, but like the clinics and like why would Kyle take one? He's already like thirty four or something like that. Why would he come to wrestling to get punched in the face to make less money? Yeah, when he could go wrestle with worse wrestlers and teach them things for a few hours for like yeah. two thousand bucks a day, or get a head coaching job at you know I don't know how many D one there's probably seventy D one schools, uh, he can get a coaching job at fifty of them, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and make six figures, yeah, yeah. and without yeah. getting punched yeah. in the face, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. Madsen is a case in point because. One of the reasons that he only has 13 professional fights at age 39 is that he went back for one more Olympics, and that's when he had his moment of glory. He went to like three Olympics, yeah, and he went back to point. one when he was like 28 years old, finally got his medal. So anything he does in MMA is almost gravy. Yeah, if he hadn't done that Olympics, maybe he has more fights, and maybe he's accomplished more in, in MMA. But you know what? He's 
he's got real close to the top of the mountain in Greco-Roman wrestling, and he's had a pretty decent uh, MMA career. The guy was undefeated until his last fight, and he got a few decent wins under his belt. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I like that he's dropped to 155. I would not have thought it was possible. The guy, Mark O'Madson, looks like... Marvin Eastman, like a, a melanin challenge Marvin Eastman, where his lats and his... I was going to say, there's something about that, that might be a little different. <laughs> well, yeah, well, a yeah. negative of Marvin Eastman. You know, like when you get yeah. this... Yeah, because yeah. yeah. his lats and his uh, his deltoids just like... He looks like a He-Man figure. Uh, I agree that his wrestling is... I, I'm not going to say it's overrated, because it is. he is a good wrestler, but... It's not what you would expect from a guy that looks like he is and has the credentials he does. He's the 39-year-old man who was once a very elite wrestler in yeah. a somewhat niche style of wrestling. And, and, and sorry to interrupt you again. I, I, it's very rare for me to do this. Uh, Greco-Roman <laughs> is probably the least effective. Of, of the three major wrestling styles, Gre I, in my opinion, Greco-Roman is the least effective MMA because it's the most limited. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, uh, the the Greco-Roman wrestlers who have excelled in MMA, it is for the most part not been with their Greco-Roman wrestling. It's just they yeah. turn into clinch monsters. Yeah, like people always I remember. Oh, Randy Couture was Greco-Roman wrestling. Yeah, he also was a uh, NCAA runner-up in folk style. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah like yeah, yeah. He's still shooting the, doubles. The, the funny thing about uh, Randy Couture in MMA is he used the clinch to just maul people, and even in his late thirties, he would shoot takedowns on people. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, I, Madsen at this point in his career and at this level wins fights when he can grind people out. I, I, he's happy to strike, but he has to be able to slow the pace when he wants to by either getting takedowns or working for takedowns in a way that occupy all of his opponent's attention. Uh, the ground was not a safe place against Grant Dawson, nor was the feet, and he got mauled. It's tough to grind out Jared Gordon. You look at his, you look at the people who've beaten Jared Gordon. It's either just much better fighters, uh, your Diego Fajeda's, Charles Oliveira's, Grant Dawson's, uh, or Patty Pimblett getting kind of a gifty decision. When people try to grind out Jared Gordon, he generally is up to the task. Uh, you you said he has a few minor flaws but no glaring weaknesses and he's pretty good everywhere he's not a great athlete but he's just super tough and persistent and pushes a pace and that's been enough to carry him to pretty respectable success and i think it's going to be enough against madsen here especially because as you mentioned madsen's gas tank seems to be waning quickly between his age and probably fighting at 155 pounds whereas gordon is coming up from being a guy that used to bounce back and forth at featherweight I expect Gordon is going to win this fight, and then it might look close and tentative early, but I think Gordon's going to win this going away, and it's going to be a rout by the end. I'm going to say it makes it to the final horn, but uh, I, I do have Gordon big time in this one. We stay in the lightweight division and get another pair of up-and-comers in the form of Nazim Sadikov and Slava Borshov. Sadikov, the 29-year-old Azerbaijani by way of Long Island, is 9-1 overall. He's 2-0 since joining the UFC out of the sixth season of Dana White's Contender Series. He has stoppage wins over Evan Elder and Terrence McKinney in that time. The most recent of those, the McKinney fight, was back at the Holm versus Bueno Silva fight night in July. So he's going to look to make it uh, three in a row in the UFC, continue to distinguish himself as one of the more intriguing up-and-comers in the division, and he'll look to do it against Borshov. Uh, Borshov, 31-year-old Russian by way of uh, Northern California, is 7-3 and three overall. He is 2-2 two and two since joining the UFC out of Season 5 of Dana White's Contender Series. Uh, he is coming in off of a win. He knocked out uh, Mahashate in the second round back at the Dern versus Hill fight nights in May. Prior to that, he had back-to-back -back decision losses to Mark Jacquesi and Mike Davis. Your odds? Uh, the favorite is minus 135. The underdog, plus 115. Keith Schillen, who are they? <laughs> Dude, you weren't lying. These lines are close. <laughs> um, fuck, man. I, I, I'll go with a local guy. I'll go with uh, Sadiakov being uh, the very slight favorite. 
You are correct, sir. You're back to your winning ways. Sadikov is minus 135. Barshov plus 115. Uh, I, I like this matchup. It's an interesting one. Uh, obviously, all the up-and-coming prospect shine is off of Slava Borshov. There was hope that he was your next, that he might turn into your next McGregor O'Malley type, this brash knockout artist who who had, uh, you know, uh, a cocky attitude and, and some good sound bites. I hate using the term exposed because it seems so uh, disrespectful, but the paths to victory over Slava Borshov were made pretty clear in his back-to-back losses to Jukhazy and, and Davis. And unfortunately for Borshov, it is a path to victory that Sadikov is probably just looking at check, check, check. I, I can do that. Uh, Borshov, w- when he's given space to strike, uh, is pretty dazzling. Uh, he has good fundamentals to his kickboxing. You know, he throws a good jab. He has nice kicks to multiple levels. Uh, When left to his own devices, he will throw good enough volume, but that volume gets muted really quickly. One, when somebody puts him on the back foot. Two, when somebody takes him down or he knows they're going to try to take him down. Or three, when he gets tired and all three have happened to him in in his UFC run. And against Sadikov, a guy that enjoys... Uh, banging it out on the feet, but is capable of wrestling. I think that spells bad news. I feel as though this is a pretty close competitive fight. Borshov is definitely capable of hurting Sadikov, especially early on. But I was surprised that the line is as tight as it is, just because Sadikov taking down Borshov seems like such a an obvious route to victory to me. That's what I'm going with here. I mean, it's not an upset pick or anything, but I feel pretty confident in it for a guy that's only a minus 135 favorite. Uh, I, Borshov in his losses, I mean, he's been tired, discouraged, but he's not been just beaten. So I'm going to say this one makes it to the final horn. This is me picking five decisions in a row to open the card. But in my defense, I think almost all of them, I think actually all five of them should be really good fights. But give me Sadikov to take a win over Borshov where he probably wins all three rounds and he wins them in increasingly dominant fashion as Borshov starts to get tired. Yeah. Um, Borshov, I mean, he's an incredible striker. I mean, he's a K1 kickboxing champion. He, 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 does have this like Muay Thai style to him where he, you know, stands in front of his opponent tall and just kind of like, you know, doesn't move, stays right there. But he made the dude's hands are blazingly fast, explosive, accurate. He's got a great jab. He follows up with, with mean tight hooks. He's good at slipping his head just off the center line and countering with his own shots. Crushes the body with 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 punches. I mean, he smashed up. Uh, uh, Dakota Bush with with body shots. I love his kicking game. Kicks to all areas of the body. Destroys the calves. Has serious power. Uh, defensively, I mean, he's he's been rocked though. Like Chris Duncan dropped him with a calf kick. Uh, he's been hurt in, in fights. But obviously, that's not what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned with exactly what you're talking about. He, he's got no offensive grappling, and he's got one of the worst defensive wrestling in possibly the the entire UFC. I mean, Mark it, okay. Real quick question. Yeah. For you, is he the worst wrestler ever to come out of Team Alpha Male? Um, like what must it be like for him to be in that room? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, see, because I'm trying to think of like wrestlers for Team Alpha Male. I mean, I think people who come out of Team Alpha Male, I just keep thinking of like, uh, you know, Chad Mendes, uh, TJ Dillashaw, Cody Garbrandt. Uh, uh, yeah, obviously you're right favor uh Danny Castillo. It's like it's rough, man. <laughs> yeah. Who's the guy there yeah, that uh he got the concussion and couldn't fight anymore? Um Holsworth, Chris Holsworth. Like, I he mean, can't remember guys, he can't remember it either. So yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fucked up. <laughs> um I mean Dwayne Ludwig was wasn't a strong wrestler, but he, he was he he wasn't he he was one of these guys that he was a better grappler than he got credited with because he was such a dynamic uh striker mm-hmm. um i mean he's gotta be I'm, i mean there might be somebody without thinking of uh wasn't sage northcott with them for a little while yes he was for a while but still and, no, and so I, was Paige van zant 
Paige Van Zandt, and I, I think they're both better wrestlers. Yeah. I mean, the guy, the guy got taken down by Mark DeCasey 11 times. He was taken down by Mike Davis nine times. And then not only that, but he, he can't he can't get up off the bottom too, which is which is an issue. Uh, Sadikov, he's a southpaw. He's a pressure striker, good at slipping and ripping. He's got a uh, a, a nice straight uh, left hand. I I love that he crushes the body. He's got good power. He he does some spinning stuff, which I'm I'm not crazy about. I definitely hope he doesn't do that with with a striker like Barshkov. Uh, would it be smart? Uh, you mentioned the wrestling, though. He can wrestle. That's the thing. He's a well-rounded uh, MMA fighter. He's got a nice ground and pound. If taken down, he does well to get back up, and he has a submission threat. I mean, he's sub Terrence Bikini, and he's got good cardio. Uh, I really, really want to take Barsha. Like, I want him to be good. He's so much fun. Like, his striking is so yes. fun. Uh, but anybody with wrestling, I'm going to pick them until he shows me he's improved his takedown defense. And some people will never improve that takedown defense. Uh, he hasn't fought in a while, so hopefully, you know, that's the case he's improved. But Sadikov is a good striker. He might want to test out his skills on the feet. I don't suggest doing that. I mean, why do that? The easy avenue for victory is just to wrestle. Now, he's in New York, hometown crowd. He might get, you know, get all excited and try to, like, you know, his crowd's cheering for him, wants to land a big shot. But, I mean, why take the chance? I mean, just wrestle, and I'm with you. I say Sadikov wins, and I, I actually like the way you broke it down. That he, the longer the fight goes on, the the more he starts pulling away from the pack. Uh, give me Sadikov by decision. Strawweights take the cage next as Tabitha Ricci faces off against Lupi Godinez. Ricci, the 28 year old Brazilian, is nine and one overall. She's four and one in the UFC. She is four and zero at strawweight. She made a short notice debut up a weight class against then prospect, now contender Manon Fior. Came out on the wrong end of that. Since then, she has rattled off four straight wins over Maria Oliveira, Poliana Viana, Jessica Penne, and Jillian Robertson. The most recent of those, the Robertson fight, was at the Emmett versus Tapuria card back in June. She will look to make it five in a row and continue making her way up the rankings, perhaps into contention against Godinez. Uh, Godinez, 30-year-old Mexican by way of Canada, is 11-3 and overall. She is 6-3 and in the UFC. She's on a three-fight win streak, uh, fought most recently in September at UFC Fight Night, Grasso versus Shevchenko 2, where she choked out Elise Reed in the second round. Uh, your odds, your favorite is minus 170. Your underdog is plus 145. Who are they, Keith? Yeah, first of all, the odds are too wide, I think. Um, the favorite, oof, I don't know. I like both these, <laughs> I like both of these fighters. Uh, Godinez. You are correct. Your favorite is Lupi Godinez at minus 170 or so. Your underdog That's comes back at wide. 145 in the form of Tabitha Ricci. Uh, Tabitha Ricci, along with uh, Benoit Saint-Denis, who fights a little further up this card, is a walking example of two principles. One, weight classes exist for a reason. Two, short notice uh, debuts are not always the best way to measure how good a fighter is. Uh, just stepping in against Manon Fior on short notice was a big, big ask. But since then, Ricci's been pretty impressive. I, I mean... I want to call her limited, but I think it's more that she just has a favorite route to victory and she's going to keep riding that horse until somebody stops it. And since Fior, nobody nobody has. And you can argue that Ricci hasn't even faced that much adversity in, in her four wins. She's kind of overwhelmed these women. And that includes a couple of the better grapplers in the division in Viana and, and Robertson. And even Penne and Oliveira are no dummies on the ground. But... Ricci likes to brawl it out on the feet. Uh, she likes to bring fights to the ground. She doesn't really care how it gets there. And once she's there, I just, you know, very uh, aggressive, likes scrambles, uh, capable of, I mean, she's capable of being positionally sound, but I think her favorite fights involve her kind of snatching a submission in a scramble or, you know, from an unexpected angle. She's helped in this by the fact that she is a plus athlete. I mean, you just have to look at her. She's a little ball of muscle. She's very fast, kinetic, explosive. When she's not facing 
giant Monofior. She's physically strong for the division, even if she's short and compact. I just think this is a little bit of a rough style matchup against Godinez because while Ricci has been perfectly comfortable on the ground against elite submission grapplers, she does best in her fights, I think, when she is the better wrestler. And aside from Tatiana Suarez, I don't think there is a better uh, there might not be a better wrestler in the strawweight division than than Lupi Godinez. I mean, Godinez, in at least the last couple of years, in you know since her loss to Luana Carolina up a weight class, her one loss is to Angela Hill, and kind of like we talked about last week in previewing Angela Hill's fight, it was mostly because Godinez made the mystifying decision not really to try to wrestle her. Uh, Godinez. The wrestling is always going to get mentioned first. You know, she's a decorated amateur wrestler, and she has two sisters that I believe are even more so than her. Uh, but that belies the fact that I think her striking is actually pretty good. Uh, I think she is defensively fairly sound, throws with good power, stays pretty tight and compact. I think she's probably helped in her striking by the threat of the takedown. I think her opponents are, are constantly conscious of that. In her last couple of fights, Cynthia Calvillo, Emily Ducote, Elise Reed. I think that was definitely the case for all three of them. But here, I think if this fight stays on the feet, Godinez probably has the slight advantage. And I think this fight probably only goes to the ground if, when, where, and how Godinez wants it. So I think it'll be a close fight. Ricci's good at creating chaos and trying to take advantage of it. But... I am leaning Godinez here as the favorite, though I agree with you. I'm surprised at how wide the line is. Give me Godinez by decision in a barn burner of a strawweight match. Yeah, this is a this is a great fight, man. Like I like both of these fighters a lot. You know, this I think this fight should be on the on the pay per view main card. Uh, no disrespect to all the other fights on the card; they're all good fights. Mm-hmm. You know, but. I, I mean, the winner of this fight, I like. I can see being a top ten fighter or better, despite you know, Ricci being really undersized. I think they're both a little undersized, but I mean, Ricci really being undersized. Uh, I think they're both really talented. Uh, Godinez is a you know wrestle boxer, high output striker on the feet. She does well to cut cut the cage off and tra- trap her opponents at times. She works well in the pocket. She you mentioned she's got quick hands, tight inside shots. I love her straight right. Uh, she does have some good pop in her hands. She really gets in there and steps into her shots. I mean, her wrestling is off the charts when she uses it. I mean, she, she's really good. I mean, the the issue is she'll ignore her wrestling the time. She'll fall in love with her hands. Uh, I mean, she gave a fight away to Angela Hill. I, I truly believe that. I think that's a fight she could have won if she just wrestled. And, and she almost did the same thing against Cynthia Calvillo. The fight was closer than it should have been. She's she's a good combination of of technique technical skills and explosion uh, with her wrestling. She's good, great entries. She's super strong when she gets a gets a limb. Her opponent's going to go for a ride. She gets on her hips and I mean she slams. I mean she threw Jessica Penny around, Silvana Gomez Suarez. She threw around Luma Labumi, Elise Reed. I mean, they're all were victims to her wrestling, but the most impressive was the Ariana Connor Lucy. Like I always joke, she hit a duck under, and it was, she just don't see, yeah. you know. Uh, she was taking her down over and over again. Uh, she's got strong takedown defense. Someone tries to take her down. Uh, she's definitely when it comes to the overall grappler, she's more of a top side grappler. Uh, she's very good at following the hips. I mean, you like Grammy roll. She she rolls with it and stuff. She's she's really slick. Uh, and her BJJ skills are, you know, she's not just wrestling, but she hit a belly down armbar against Suarez. She got a rear naked choke against Reed. I, I like, I really think if if Godinez could get a little bit better fight IQ, I think she could be a, a top ten fighter for sure. Now, Ricci, I feel the same exact way. I mean, she's she's a really short fighter. You know, that that's always going to be a little bit of a struggle for her, uh, especially with the bigger women of the division. I mean, like like a Tatiana Suarez, the, the, one it's a best out match for anyways. But I mean, just like a bigger bigger one for the weight class uh, but she's well rounded I, I think her striking is a is better than I, I think I like the way you said it that not that she's one-dimensional but she's she's got a little Bilal Muhammad in her where 
like I'm such a good wrestler, like stop me, <laughs> you know. But he can still strike, and she I feel the same with her. Like she moves well, uh, her boxing's good. She fights out of both stances. She's good at getting in and out of of range and landing strikes. Uh, she cuts angles well in her attacks, so she's not always coming from the same, you know, coming straight on the on the center line. Uh, she's she's got some quick hands. She she does have a little bit of like a Dan Henderson thing in her where she loves to throw the overhand a little bit too much. Uh, some of that is probably the close distance. Um, she she tries rolling with punches, which I defensively, which I I don't think it looks good with with the judges. Uh, definitely more of a boxing technique than anything. But that's something I wish she would change. But she's got a judo background. She, she likes to use her height disadvantage. <laughs> she actually uses it well in the clinch. She kind of gets underneath her opponent's chin and in, in, in solid head position. And, and then, you know, she'll get a lot of upper body takedowns. But she can also, like, wrestle, like, tr- traditional entries. Like, she's she's got some good timing on her takedowns. Get on top. She's definitely a top sub grappler. Like, good pressure on top. Really good BJJ. She's got three subs on her, her record. But I, she could have more. I mean, she's she's going to sub a lot more people because she's very patient. She's, um, you know, doesn't rush anything, and she showed ability to get like Pollyanna Viana to avoid submissions. It, you know, like I said, I really like. I love this matchup. I, I, I think the striking is closer, but Godinez has the power advantage in in the hand. She definitely hits harder of the two. Uh, I. Absolutely love Godinez's wrestling when she uses it. I hate picking against Richie because I'm so high on her. Uh, there's there's very few fighters in the division. I shouldn't say few, but there's there's, there's not many in the division. Uh, that's, I guess the same way of saying it. <laughs> um, I, I just, I mean, it's such a good division for female fighters. But it just, I'm saying, like, if, if you beat Tabitha Richie to me, you're good. Like, you're, you're a really good fighter, and that's what I think Godinez is. I think stylistically, because Richie's takedowns is such a big part of her game, being a topside grappler is such a big part of her game, I think she might struggle to get um, Godinez down. And I think Godinez might even go for a takedown one or two for herself, which I think would be smart for her to win close rounds. Uh, I don't always trust her to use her wrestling. But I think we might get a little bit of sprawl and brawl thing going on uh, where she lands the hardest shots on the feet. So give me good DNA's by decision. The top prelim at Madison Square Garden this Saturday is a men's flyweight matchup between Steve Urseg and Alessandro Costa. Urseg, the 28-year-old Australian, is 10-1 and overall. He's 1-0 in the UFC. He made a short-notice debut at UFC 289 back in June and took a unanimous decision over David Dvorak in a pretty stunning upset at the time. Uh, he'll look to capitalize on the momentum of that debut win against Costa. Uh, 27-year-old Brazilian, 13-3 and overall. He is 1-1 one one since joining the UFC as a veteran of Season 6 of Dana White's Contender Series. Uh, he fought, he won, was not immediately signed, but he was signed last December and... Uh, was knocked out by Amir Albazi in his UFC debut, came back and knocked out Jimmy Flick in his sophomore appearance at UFC on ESPN, Vittori versus Cannoneer in June. So uh, he's going to look to build on that momentum. And your favorite is minus 155, your underdog plus 135. Keith, who are they? Uh, I'll say Ursig is the favorite. You are correct. Steve Urseg, minus 155. Alessandro Costa, plus 135. For those keeping track at home, Keith is 6-1 and one in correctly picking the favorite in these fights so far. Uh, Keith, who, who wins this one? How do they win? And considering that both these gentlemen are in their 20s and fairly new to the UFC, if one of these guys is a top 10 fighter two years from now, who is it? Um, that's tough. That's that's a really tough question. Um, I mean, Ursig already has the better win on his record. Um, wow, well, Costa might have the higher upside. I might actually say Costa. Uh, it might. I don't know. It's tough. That's such a tough division. It's. I mean, you really got to be so well rounded. Uh, but I, I like both of them. I think it's. I, I I think this fight is too high up the card. 
based on just credentials, based on the credentials of the two fighters we just talked about. But you know, it's a really fun fight. I mean, I love flyweights. So I, I, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining. You know, so flyweights keep getting love. One thing I neglected to mention: uh, Alessandro Costa is stepping in for Matt Schnell. It's not on terribly late notice. Like he's had a good while to prepare, but worth noting that this was originally Steve Ursegg versus Matt Schnell, who is the new Ian McCall in terms of the guy who's a top yeah, ten talent, but shit. but yeah. literally pulls out of twice as many fights as he as he takes so yeah, yeah. Anyway. i i i wonder if it's this high of the card because of of snell being on it and you know where they want to put him or something uh so it's back to this ursig he he's a large flyweight he's he's well-rounded he's a boxer not the fastest hands but he's got good popping him uh he's he's he needs to clean up some of his defensive issues he stands too tall he keeps his chin too high uh, he doesn't have move his hands enough but but he's like i said he can crack uh, he throws a lot of kicks good kicking game uh, though he doesn't set them up sometimes he's a little open to counters uh he can wrestle though he he took the, the david to work down three times he has some slick submissions six subs he had dvorak in trouble uh many times in that fight costa he's he's short stocky jacked flyweight uh, you know not the greatest athlete but he looked great against jimmy flick uh, he tends to fight in spurts where, you know, he, he, he lulls, he lulls, and then he gets in the pocket and he throws a big combination. He throws hard shots, a lot of wild shots, but he, he rips the body. Um, he hits hard. You know, he can be low output, though, be, you know, when I talk about him lulling, which is not a good sign in this division because most of the guys have such high output. He, he kind of fights in, 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 like I said, he fights in spurts. Uh, you know, he showed in the, like the contender series didn't have the best output. Uh, he does throw hard kicks, good calf kicks. Uh, he can get to fight the ground. Definitely more of a grappler than a pure wrestler. Uh, he has six subs on his record. It, this is a really fun scrap. I mean, I love flyweights. Uh, these two guys both have a lot of promise. I've, I've flip flopped on this one. You know, uh, I, I'm gonna go with Urseg due to his output. He, he, he definitely has the, you know, like if. I can see him just winning on volume and you know looking better in, in the judges' eyes from that. Uh, I also think he might have a slight edge in the wrestling, but I think both guys are going to have moments. I think it's going to be a really close fight. Uh, Ursig, you know, he's not the one taking the fight on short notice, which you know, like you said, not not crazy short notice, but still, you know, when when all things are pretty even, I'll, I'll take start going with the intangibles. So give me I mean, give me Ursig. I'll say it's really close. I'll say split decision. Yeah, I I like the breakdown there and. I was surprised by how good Ursag looked against David Dvorak in his debut. Even knowing that Dvorak is kind of reeling at this point, just all the wheels seem to be falling off at the same time. I remember scouting Steve Ursag and just not being that impressed. And I say not that impressed. He was a guy that came into his last fight on, I think, like an eight-fight win streak, but just... Because he doesn't look like a great athlete or a tough fighter, there's something even in guys like me that have been watching the sport for a long time and should be beyond that that just leads me to underestimate. I mean, he, he looks like Luke Kumo, you know, just kind of like looks like this unassuming dude that you, you know, just see at the gym, like riding the elliptical or something. Uh, but he may just be the type of guy that ends up fighting up to the level of the competition they put him in front of until he's finally truly overmatched. Like he looked really good against Dvorak and not only did he win, but you kind of laid out Dvorak's whole thing is that at his best, he's very well-rounded and he's an explosive athlete. And Ursic just gave at least as well as he got everywhere. He held his own in the striking, even though he looked like the slower guy, he more than held his own in the wrestling. Like Dvorak was able to take him down a couple times, but Ursag reversed him. When Ursag took him, took him down, he got a, some pretty emphatic uh, mat returns. Just he turned out to be better everywhere than a than a guy that I thought was a, a top fifteen talent. Uh, I'm not going to be slow to come around on Steve Ursag. I'm I'm going to get on on the train at the appropriate time for once in my life. Uh, <laughs> here, I like Costa as, as an up and comer as well, but I do think he is a little bit limited. 
Uh, he barely squeaked by a not very good fighter on the contender series. He got plunked by Amir Albazi, and granted, Albazi is a potential future champ. He blew away Jimmy Flick, but Jimmy Flick may have just been a flash in the pan in the UFC. Like, aside from one incredible highlight, yeah. that he's never going to, like, nobody will ever take away the flying armbar from him. And that flying armbar is just going to continue to age better and better considering yeah. who he did it on. I agree. He's been retiring at weird times, looking unmotivated, looking limited. Uh, like I said, Urseg looks like Luke Kumo. Well, you know, Jimmy Flick looks like uh, Dustin Hazlett, but yeah, just not, not as awesome. Yeah. Uh, Costa may be a future contender, but he's yet to prove it against the kind of opposition Urseg has faced. Uh, give me Urseg to, to win here. And considering just how he was the fresher guy in the third round and really winning, pulling away, even though he was the short notice fighter, I expect Urseg is really going to get stronger as the fight goes along here. So give me Urseg to get a submission in the third round. Uh, I, I expect the first round might be fire. The second round, we might see Urseg start to pull away and Costa's just gritting it out by the third. Urseg hurts him on the feet, gets him down and chokes him out. So give me Urseg by round three submission. There is the possibility that the first three fights on the five fight main card of UFC 295 get juggled a little bit during fight week. But at least as of right now, the main card opener is a featherweight matchup between Diego Lopez and Pat Sabatini. Lopez, the 28-year-old Brazilian, is 22-6 and six overall. He is 1-1 one one since joining the UFC as a veteran of Dana White's Contender Series. He appeared on Season 5, lost to Joe Anderson Brito, uh, went and won a couple fights in various regional promotions, including Fury Fighting Championship, and got signed in May to take on Movsar Evloev. He dropped a unanimous decision in what can only be described as a very, very tough first ask for a, a debuting fighter, but came back and made good on that by tapping out Gavin Tucker in August at UFC on ESPN Sandhagen versus Font. He will try to make it two in a row against Sabatini. A uh, 32-year-old Pennsylvania native is 18-4 and four overall. He is 5-1 and one in the UFC. Uh, his lone loss was against Damon Jackson, man of destiny uh, at the time, if you remember, last September at UFC Fight Night Sandhagen versus Song. But he bounced back from that loss with a second-round submission of Lucas Almeida this June at UFC on ESPN, Vittori versus Cannoneer. Keith, your favorite is minus 125. Your underdog is plus 105. Who are they? <laughs> Man, that's a tough one. Uh, Sabatini is a favorite. You are correct, sir. Pat Sabatini, minus 125 or so. Diego Lopez available just barely in the plus money at 105. Uh, who wins it and and how? Like, do you agree with the odds makers that this is a razor close fight? Yeah, I do. I, I definitely do. I mean, this is one that I've, I'm, I don't have a lot of confidence in. I, you know, they're, they're, they have a lot of similarities, but they also have a lot of, of differences between these two guys. Uh, you know, Sabatini being a, Henzo Gracie Philly guy, you know that's my team. I love that team. Like I just they they're so good. Uh, he's he's not a good athlete. Like, he's 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 not he's not winning triathlons or anything like that. He he's a karate style striker who has this like wide base that he's a serviceable boxer. Nothing really stands out on the feet. Uh, I do like that he works the body. He's got some underrated power. Because of that karate style, he'll toss out some spinning attacks. Uh, but everything he's doing on the feet is really just to get a chance to, when he has an opportunity to, to close distance, close distance. He's a really good wrestler. Nice entries, good top control, mean ground and pound. He is a submission threat. I mean, look at his beautiful heel hook he hit on Jamal Emers. Uh, that's what I mean, that's what he does. He, he, he wants to get the fight to the ground, and he's just going to suffocate. And, and and then control and final submission. Not that many notes on him because it's it's kind of like rinse and repeat, same thing every, every single fight. Uh, uh, Lopes, uh, he, I mean, 
the dude took out a stud and everywhere on day's notice on a pay per view main event card in his debut and gave him everything he can handle. And right then, I became a fan of this guy. He's he's a, he's a massive featherweight. He's well rounded. I I like his boxing. He, he likes to close the distance and throw it out of the pocket. Nice short tight shots. I love his his straight right. I love his left hook. I love that he works the body. He's got good good power. He steps into his shots, sits on his punches. I mean, he hurt Evolev in that fight and almost knocked him out. A good kicking game, great calf kicks. Uh, he still needs to improve his head movement, though. He's a little more hittable than than I would like for or, you know the guy that's moving up the ranks. Not a strong offensive wrestler, and he's probably a weak defensive wrestler as he's been taken down in every single UFC fight so far, including his contender series matchup. But his jiu is good. I mean, he's 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 a BJJ black belt who's clearly has competed in some high level competition, I mean, and it really shows submission through anybody. He's got eleven subs in his career. Tr- transitions from sub to sub so well. I mean, he had Evo have a really deep arm bar and knee bar, and, and a bunch of other subs. I mean, he, he sub Gavin Tucker really quick. Uh, the issue is he can play a little bit too much time on his back. So. This is an amazing fight. Like I, I love both guys. I mean, seventeen is such a good top side grappler, but Lopes is probably the biggest submission threat he's ever gone against. Uh, on the feet, I actually favor uh, Lopes uh, greatly. Man, I hate making this pick because I, I really feel like I mean I, I'm glad that it's, it's pretty much a pick 'em um, because I, I really feel like I'm going to get this one wrong. I'm going to go with I'm going to go with this very slight upset. I'm going to go with Lopes simply because he has two avenues for victory. I don't think Sabatini does. I, I don't think he's sub Sabatini, but I think he does enough to create scrambles and get back to his feet. Um, I, I could be wrong and he could be stuck on the ground trying to play jujitsu and go tossing up submission attacks and, and, and doesn't catch anything and loses. But uh, I'm going to say he finds a way to get to his feet. I think Sabatini slows down. He keeps landing shots and, and I actually think he's got to get, he's maybe make something happen late. I'll say Lopez uh, or Lopes, excuse me. Lopes lands a, a big shot in the third round. I see he wins my third round TKO. You know, I am going with Sabatini here, but if he loses, I believe it will be uh, by knockout. Like, he'll be fighting somebody who hits harder, is going to have better reach, better hand speed. I, like, I think that's the best route to victory for Diego Lopez. And, and aside from that, I th- if that doesn't happen, I think I know what this fight looks like. And I think it's the the battle that you basically described. Sabatini's wrestling and top game against uh, Lopez's either mounting enough offense off his back to force scrambles or to, you know, uh, allow him to escape or not being able to do that and just spending time parked under Sabatini defending himself from, you know, Sabatini trying to move to Mount, throwing ground and pound. Like, I think that's where a lot of this fight takes place and where the result kind of hinges on. I don't think you're necessarily wrong here. Again, uh, Sabatini got knocked out by Damon Jackson. I I know that he wasn't fully out when the end came, but he basically got dropped like he was shot when Damon Jackson, of all people, gave him a Leota Machida front kick to the face. Uh, And... Yeah, there's the intangibles, like maybe nobody on the planet was beating Damon Jackson that that night, but it showed Sabatini can be hurt. And if Damon Jackson can do that, a equally big, much more dynamic and much more aggressive striker like like Lopez should be able to. But I do think that's the outside chance. I, I think there's a good reason the odds are what they are. I slightly favor Sabatini to get a Pat Sabatini fight here. I think he'll get Lopez down probably in all three rounds. How much time they spend down there is what the fight will kind of hinge on. But I think he'll have Lopez stuck, if not in peril, enough to to win two out of three rounds. So give me Sabatini by decision. Next up on the UFC 295 main card is a lightweight matchup between Matt Frivola and Benoit saint Frivola, the 33-year-old New Yorker, is 11-3-1 overall. He's 5-3-1 since joining the UFC out of the very first season of Dana White's Contender Series. He has bounced back from a two-fight losing streak a couple years ago with three straight wins. Uh, He very famously 
got lamped by Terrence McKinney in what I believe was McKinney's UFC debut in just seven seconds. But since then, he is perfect with three first round knockouts of his own over Gennaro Valdez, Otman Azatar, and most recently, back at UFC 288 in May, Drew Dober, which is a an impressive feather indeed in Frivola's cap that you can see in this picture right below us. Uh, he'll look to make it four in a row and go from a fun, reliable action fighter to an actual fringe contender against saint who is kind of trying to do the same. Uh, 27-year-old Frenchman is 12 and one with one no contest overall. He is four and one in the UFC. And exactly like Tabitha Ricci, whom we talked about a little while ago, he debuted on short notice up a weight class and got absolutely mauled by a contender. It was at the time Eliseo Zaleski Dos Santos, who laid a beatdown of the year, uh, like probably the worst beatdown in high level MMA in 2021 on him, to the point that there was controversy afterwards over whether the referee should have stopped it. I mean, the referee of that fight was yanked afterwards, if you don't remember. Uh, that that was a uh, Slava Kiselev, Russian ref who does plenty of tomfoolery. But anyway, he he was pulled from the rest of the card. Uh, at any rate, after that, uh, Denny headed down to lightweight and has rattled off four straight wins inside the distance over Nicholas Stolza, Gabriel Miranda, Ismael Bonfim, and most recently at uh, UFC Fight Night 226 in September, Tiago Moises, whom he knocked out in the second round. So uh, two gentlemen kind of working their way up to uh, ranked or formerly ranked fighters on a string of uh, knockouts and submissions. They collide. Somebody's momentum has to stop. Somebody's will uh, keep trucking on. Your favorite, uh, this is the last wide line on the card. Your favorite is minus 225. Your underdog is plus 175. Who are they, Keith? Did you just say? Did you say two something? What was I saying? I'm sorry. My, your favorite is minus two twenty five. Your underdog plus one seventy five. Who are? Wow, they? I have no idea. I have no idea. That's crazy. Um, oh, man, they they're just they're disrespecting one of these guys bad. <sighs> I'm gonna guess based on knocking out Drew Dober in his last fight. I mean, that's a huge win. I know, but Saint Denis just beat the hell out of Thiago Moises. Uh, and before that is my album theme. Yeah, fuck. That this is crazy. The odds makers are way off on this one. I have no idea. I I, I can't imagine any one of these guys being that big of a favorite. You know what? I could see them dissing Favola. Like I, I'll go with Saint Denis as a favorite. You are correct, sir. Benoit saint minus 225. Matt, the steamroller for Vola, plus 175 on the comeback. Uh, tell me who you think wins and why you think that line is bananas. Yeah, just, I mean, just watch, watch like, Frivola's last fight knocking out Drew Dober and tell me he should be that big of an underdog. Like, that's crazy. And not, not that he's been underdog, um, but... To be that big is is extremely surprising to me. Um, man. Wow, I'm just I'm surprised by that. Like being I thought the lines have been pretty good all night. You know, might disagree, think some of them should be a little bit closer, but that's this one's this one's nuts. Um I'll start I'll start with Matt Favola, the the local guy. He's he's this crazy output guy. I mean that's he's he beats guys with pressure. He's very unconventional style, very herky jerky style. He's a brawler on the feet, nice snap on his shots, explosive. Uh, he wants to throw it out of the pocket, mean hard hooks. He has serious power. I mean, he's got three straight first round TKOs. Uh, he doesn't have much for defense though. Uh, he's you know he's 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 definitely one of these guys willing to eat a shot to to land one of his own. He's a good wrestler. He's got some fast entries. He will often shoot too far away without a setup. But he's good at winning scrambles. I like that he looks to land strikes in the scramble exchanges, not just winning the positions. Like while they're scrambling, he, he's landing shots, uh, breaking from the clinch, things like that. He's got really good cardio; just keeps coming. Uh, tons of heart. When we've seen him, you know, he, he's not flawless. So I, I guess that's probably why he's 
it's probably why he's such a under well, it shouldn't be that big of a dog, but why he's the underdog in this because yet yeah, he's he's been hurt in fights. Jalen Turner hurt him, Luis Pena, Atlanta went out of it. Even in those fights, he just keeps coming. Uh, he's got three submission wins. I mean, he almost subbed uh, Jalen Turner uh, with a guillotine in that fight. Uh, uh, Saint Denis, I mean, the dude looks sensational lately. Very athletic. He's a southpaw. Incredible output. I mean, he just walked down Tiago Moises in an incredible showing. Quick hands, good power, great kicking game. Uh, I love his high kick. Uh, the issue is he still has some defensive holes. He's very hittable. He keeps his chin a little too high. He lacks head movement. Now, we talked about from old, like, when the Ian shot, I mean, this guy's the toughest dude alive. I mean, you go back to the Seleski fight, it, it, you know, we, we talk about the referee, you know, should have stopped the fight, but, like, he – Saint Denis didn't look for a way out, <laughs> you know. It was too tough for his own good. I mean, he's this like, you know, French special force guy and stuff. So I mean, that's brighted in him. He's very physically strong. He gets the clinch. Uh, he can work there. He has a judo background, so he likes upper body takedowns. Some good back takes. He's got nine submission wins, so he's definitely a submission threat. Uh, he he will jump on on something like trying to stop a takedown, like jump on a guillotine or something. Uh, but if he's on top, he's got really good grab on I me. Mean, he Brendan pound the hell out of Tiago Moises. Uh, what a great fight this is! I love both of these guys. I do want to mention that when I was in New York City, uh, you know, you get a lot of time downtime. Um, I've, I've done the sightseeing, so I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not taking the, the time in between. I mean, I might go get a slice of pizza at a nice place or something like that because New York City's got really good pizza, but. I like being around the hotel. I like talking to people. I like, I like you know, talk. I, I don't I don't bother the fighters. I will not buy the fighters. But the like, I'll buy the, a fighter who's not fighting, and, and and pick their brain. I don't fanboy or anything like that. But uh, I like to talk to coaches. I like to talk to family members, stuff like that. Uh, so, anyways, well, the reason I'm telling you this is I want to put this out there. I spent a like a really long time talking to Matt Frivola's brother, James. And like he's a wicked cool dude, and I remember sitting in the lobby. And we probably chatted for like an hour. <laughs> like, so I'm a little biased. I really like him. I actually say we're probably friends now. Like, um, so I just want to put that out there. That I'm a little biased. I, that's why I I, I like Farola. Uh Both guys are really good output. Both guys have really good power. Both guys can wrestle. I do think St. Denis is a, probably the faster striker and probably the more technical striker. But I'm on the fence. Like I said earlier that, you know, you said, oh, I'm not taking a fight for a fight. And I said, sign me up for this one. <laughs> you know, uh, I think we're going to have an all-time war. I think we're going to have both guys getting hurt. I think both guys are getting rocked. Uh, so I lo I'm locking this in as my fight of the night pick. You know what? The odds makers disrespected him. This is New York. This is Favola's from New York. Give me an all-time war, and I say Favola wins it. Give me Favola by split decision. I love the breakdown. I love the pick. There's there's something about Favola that I think can it can make it tempting to underestimate him. Just the knockouts. The approach, the accent. I mean, there's there's fighters yeah, from New York, and then there's Paul. fighters from New York. Yeah, he's got he, a meatball, like, at it, like you know, yeah, got meat, a meat, meathead, you know, like, he's, yeah. yeah. He's got, I mean, he's, he sounds like a cab driver. He, yeah. you know. He, <laughs> yeah. And, but, you talking but, to me? You talking to yeah, me? Exactly. But yeah. he's the guy that, yeah, his, his ideal fight is just throwing down in the pocket and catching a Drew Dober or an Atman Azatar before they catch him and walking away with the knockout. But this is also the guy that when his job was in a little bit of trouble after his first couple UFC fights, beat Jalen Turner and Luis Pena back to back with wrestling with, with Turner. It was, I mean, everybody watching this has heard my joke, but it looked like what you would expect when a steamroller met a tarantula, like it was that much of just a wrestle humping, but even against Luis Pena, who is a good wrestler, better offensively than defensively, but an underrated wrestler, you know, uh, period, he out wrestled him pretty soundly, like slammed him a few times. And it was enough to get him the nod in an otherwise very close fight. Uh, because of that, like, I feel a little more comfortable 
taking Frivola as an upset pick. He's not, unless the the expectations of the home crowd really, really, really get to him, which I'm not picking to happen. He's a guy that that's not he's not going to shut off any possible avenues to victory. Uh, I think this is going to be a barn burner of a fight as well. I think the line is silly. Both these guys are red hot right now after having been potentially written off either as just another guy in the case of Frivola or someone who maybe wasn't UFC material in the case of Saint Denis. They've both proven those assessments wrong. But Frivola's win streak, I think, is a little more impressive. The knocking out Drew Dober in the first round on the feet is that is just a hell of a thing. That is the kind of, that is the exact kind of fight that Drew Dober normally wins. So I would just ask Terrence McKinney. You've got kind of like an MMA, yeah. MMA math circle there between the three of them. He, uh, he might be the most pound for pound hardest hitter in MMA. Frivola? No, uh, the, the Dober? Drew Dober. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you. Drew, Drew Dober could very well be. He's, I'm a Dober guy. Like, I mean, yeah, I yeah Dober's, yeah. Dober's awesome. He's, yeah. uh, he's got the athleticism and power of Michael Chandler with much worse wrestling and a greater diversity of strikes. That's that's kind of what I see I, when I see. I, I'll, I'll 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 pull back the curtain for a second, and I, and I apologize if I shouldn't say this, but I was talking to uh to uh James Favola before, and I was texting him, and I'm like, dude. Yeah, you don't want to diss his brother, but like, hey, you know, uh, I'm like, gosh, a really fun fight. They both throw it down in the pocket, but like, really nice to be like, but you know, Drew Dober's always been a really weak wrestler. Like, could, you might want to just take the avenue of victory, just wrestle. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we get that, you know. <laughs> and then afterwards, <laughs> we knocked him off and said, like I told you, just freaking take a win in the wrestle and <laughs> swing for the fences. Uh, <clears throat> I am with you here. No outcome in this fight would truly surprise me other than a boring fight. But I was surprised when I saw the line. I understand why Sentini has a bunch of steam behind him. Of the two, he kind of has more of the look and vibe of... uh, of a, an elite fighter, he he is a stud. He's great. Yeah, if, I'm, not, if, if, I'm not talking shit about yeah. by picking Vola. He's get dude the stud. <laughs> yeah, if Frivola knocks Santini flat, that doesn't make Santini a bad fighter. Just no. Frav- Matt Frivola has been doing that to people, but yeah, I think Matt Frivola uh, comes out ahead. It wouldn't surprise me if a few surprise or reactive takedowns where he's timing it to what Santini is doing and not expecting rather than doing it as a safety valve because he got hurt. I like It wouldn't surprise me to see Frivola mix in a little of that, but even if he doesn't, he's he's just been money in those uh, pocket battles recently. Santini is probably dangerous at a greater variety of ranges. He definitely has more of a kicking game, but I think a lot of this fight's going to take place in Frivola's preferred range. He's pretty good at forcing that. I mean, Look no further than the three fight win streak he's on. Yeah, give me Provola to win by decision uh, as well, and it would not surprise me in the least if you're right. And this is our fight of the night. And there is your uh, unanimous Shillen and Duffy upset pick for this card. Ooh, maybe, maybe, who, maybe who knows not. if there'll maybe. be more? Yeah. <laughs> Third from the top on the UFC 295 main card. Again, at least as the card is set up as of the beginning of fight week is a strawweight matchup between former champ Jessica Andrade and uh, longtime contender Mackenzie Dern. Andrade, the 32-year-old Brazilian, is 24-12 and 12 overall. She's 15-10 and 10 in the UFC. Most relevantly to this fight, she is 7-5 and five at strawweight, a run that saw her, of course, win the title with a sensational slam knockout of Rose Nami Yunus, then surrender it immediately afterward to Wei Li Zhang. From those highest of heights, she has uh, definitely descended. She is on a three-fight skid at this point, those being a second-round submission loss to Aaron Blanchfield, a first-round knockout loss to Jan Shaunan, and a second-round submission loss to Tatiana Suarez. The most recent of those, the Suarez fight, was back in August at the UFC on ESPN Sanhagen versus Font card. While Andrade's 
losses have all come against elite fighters across two weight divisions. She nonetheless is on a skid and looking to preserve any vestiges of relevance as a contender or, or a threat to win a title in any of the divisions in which she has competed. She'll look to make that first step back against Dern. Uh, Dern, the 30 year old Brazilian with the Phoenix accent is 13 and three overall. She is nine and three in the UFC. She has alternated wins and losses over her last five fights, but she is coming in off of a win here. She last competed in May in the headliner of UFC Fight Night 223, where she took a unanimous decision over Angela Hill. Prior to that, uh, she had faced Yan Xiaonan herself and dropped a majority decision. Odds here, your favorite is minus 180. Your underdog is plus 140. Keith, who are they? Um, just gonna draw as the favorite. I'm sorry, sir. That is not correct. Oh. Mackenzie Dern <laughs> minus really? 180. Jessica Andrade plus 140. With that, I should have looked this up beforehand, but my guess would be that this is the first time Jessica Andrade has been the underdog in a non-title fight in a long, long time. I, uh, well, with that Rose, the second Rose fight, that wasn't for the title, right? The second Rose fight was yeah, no, that wasn't for the, not title. for the title. Yeah, I don't think she was a favorite of that, even though she won the first one. Yeah. Uh, oh no, no, no! This no, she just fought Tatiana Suarez. She wasn't a favorite of that one. Oh, you know what? You're right. Suarez was was the favorite there. She was the big favorite. Was she the favorite? I'll leave that in just to see, just to, yeah. so that people can see what it looks like when I try to come up with stats off the top. Of my yeah, head. you know, we're, <laughs> we're on the tape like a three hour show, and it's like yeah. midnight, so. <laughs> after yes. after midnight after uh, uh, daylight savings time, which we have no idea why the hell we're doing this anymore. The farmers better appreciate this shit because it's ruining yeah. the day for the rest well, of us. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't like the ninety nine percent of or ninety nine point nine nine percent of society who aren't farmers say, "How about this? How about you fucking guys just get up an hour earlier or later?" <laughs> like why did rest of why did rest of the society have to like adjust for you? Yeah, like. You guys can set your clocks to whatever you want. Yeah, get up an hour yeah. earlier, or, or yeah. stay, you know, this time stay an hour later. Like, like the the voting block, the real power here should be anybody who has to get kids up for elementary school. <laughs> and I tell you, they do not like it. We did yeah. not like it. Yeah, and, and, and listen, shout out to farmers. Like we love our farmers. Yes. Like we go go. They we couldn't survive without farmers. But w without farmers, I w I would not be nearly as fat as I am right now. So, yeah. <laughs> But still, get your ass up an hour earlier or later. <laughs> uh, Andrade versus Dern. Um, man, my notes on Jessica Andrade have have changed. It's not like she's lost to anyone bad. No. Just Aaron Blanchfield, still maybe Stud. a future champ at flyweight. Jan yep. Shaunan, Stud. maybe a future champ at strawweight. Tatiana Suarez. Stud. Like, <laughs> so... Yeah. Three it's stuff. possible that the things that Jessica Andrade does well could work on Mackenzie Dern. If three years ago, I would have said this is the worst style matchup imaginable for Dern because mm -hmm. Dern won't be able to get her down and she's slow and defensively porous on the feet. Andrade knocks her out in the first round. If you'd asked me three years ago, I would have been like, Andrade knocks her out in the first round. Uh, Jessica Andrade is, I mean, she started in the UFC as a bantamweight. She was short and stocky as a bantamweight. She dropped to flyweight. Well, actually, she she dropped all the way to strawweight because there was no flyweight division. She was short and stocky for a strawweight. She's she's one of the shortest strawweights in the division. It's impressive that she had plus power at 135 pounds. At 115, at her best, she was one of the hardest pound for pound hitters in the sport. Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, not a whole lot of nuance or technique behind it. She's definitely a brawler who. Uh, you know, steps in behind big, hard hooks, haymakers. Having said that, there's nuance in the fact that she's willing to go to the body. I mean, she killed Caitlin Chikagian with a body shot. Uh, she doesn't kick a lot, but when she does, her kicks are very hard. Uh, yeah. She's a good offensive wrestler purely on power yeah. and aggression. Uh, she's good at, you know, fainting punches changing levels and just being on a woman's hips before she realizes that she's not being punched in the face finishes, uh, finishes takedowns with authority. Just ask Rose Namajunas or well, 
you'll probably need to show Rose the tape. But uh, and coming back, she was. I'm not saying she's Mike Tyson, but between being so kinetic, short, compact, she was kind of hard to hit cleanly. But when she was hit hard, she, she seemed to be hard to hurt. Like Rose Namajunas, who has underrated power, uh, even in their first fight, you know, the story of that fight early on was Namajunas kind of piecing Andrade up on the feet. Andrade trying unsuccessfully to get takedowns until she got the one that finished it. But Andrade was never really hurt her, just kind of frustrated. But that's gone away. Now women are hurting her. Uh, women are getting her to the ground yeah. and really taking advantage of her on the ground. The first uh, woman I can remember doing that was Valentina Shevchenko. But Shevchenko's much bigger. And at the time, she was arguably the best fighter in the sport. Uh, yeah. Blanchfield ran over Andrade on the ground. Suarez ran over Andrade on the ground. Like, Andrade, is, it's just natural aging. She's... she's sure. She slowed a tick. She's still extremely strong, but the explosion that allowed her to just sprawl so hard on takedowns that like she bashed women's faces against the floor seems to have gone away. Now she just seems undersized and not fast enough to make it work. And she's taking, like I said, if, if you'd asked me three years ago, I would have said this is the worst possible matchup for uh, Mackenzie Dern. It's almost the opposite because Dern's striking is still ugly, uh, but even though she gets hit squarely pretty often, she's kind of hard to hurt. So if she has to take a Jessica Andrade haymaker, that isn't the death sentence it used to be. Dern, for as good a grappler as she is, and she is probably the most decorated female grappler ever to cross over to MMA anywhere near her uh, athletic prime, it has just still never developed into a good wrestler. Like all of her, like, and it's just because she's slow on her feet. She's physically strong. She can get great, you know, good trips and throws from the clinch when she can get a hold of a woman often against the fence. But, you know, she's never had a shot from the outside. Uh, but it makes, she makes it work just through persistence, physical strength, durability, actually being able to kind of wear down other women, you wouldn't think that would be the case for a fighter who historically had a horrible time making weight. But here, I think she's, even if Andrade puts a scare in her early, I think Dern's going to win just through sheer persistence here. Like even if Andrade has a vintage Jessica Andrade first round, like say we get a 10-8 first round, Dern's face is bloody, she's 0 for 3 on takedown attempts and got knocked down, I still like Dern in this fight. Uh, I think Dern will probably grow stronger as the fight goes along, where I'm not sure about that in the case of Andrade. And once Dern gets Andrade down, Andrade isn't doing the, like, female Derek Lewis bench press you off and get up anymore. Uh, give me Dern by second round submission here, uh, and maybe that'll be enough to get her the title shot that the UFC clearly would love for her to get before it's all said and done. But yeah, I've got Dern here big time. Man, this is uh, man. Imagine, imagine this fight being booked two years ago. <laughs> you know what the what the odds would have been for Jessica Andrade, and now she's she's the underdog. I mean, it's, it, Andrade has seen better days. She obviously is clearly on the decline. But but you mentioned it. I mean, in fact, she's she's lost to three studs. So um, you know, pump the brakes a little bit on the decline, but. The things she was always good at, the things that could just fall off a cliff very fast. Other than natural Can, can I interject something real quick? Sure. I said three years ago, as recently as the beginning of this year. At the beginning of this year, Andrade was on the three-fight win streak over Calvillo, Lemos, and Murphy. Like She choked out Amanda Lemos with that standing arm triangle choke in April of last year. Uh -huh. This January, she... Had a pretty dominant performance over Lauren Murphy. She was 3-0 and since losing to Shevchenko, and Durham was coming off the loss to Jan. I think Andrade might have yeah. been a minus 400 favorite if they fought this February. Who, do you remember who Aaron Blanchard was supposed to fight instead of Jessica Andrade? I am trying to... It wasn't Manon Fior, was it? Um, I don't... <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I you know, Tyler Santos. Like she was supposed to fight Tyler oh, Santos. Tyler Santos. Oh yeah, they ended up doing the fight anyways. Yeah. But I remember when 
Jesse Andrade stepped up on like very, very like a week notice or something. The and it was well, we we said it ourselves. The narrative was, oh my god, poor Aaron Blanchfield gets to fight Jessica Andrade on one week notice. Like, like damn, like who, who did you piss off in the world, you know? And that was not that long ago. So, no. and obviously she she passed that test with flying colors, and we all looked like idiots. Um, you know, it's because of the three fighters she's fought, and she's got taken out pretty easily by all three of them it, it you know it's hard to see what he's she still does well now she's always been a high volume striker which is crazy for someone to throw so much power i mean she's always fearlessly walked down her foes constantly taking the ground when she's blitzes it was always like a scary thing throwing tight hard hooks hits very very hard and what was most impressive is someone who throws these hard hooks and always moving forward i was the thing i'll always remember about jessica when she retires i'll say to see a power puncher to throw as many hard power, everything she threw was power, power, power. And to be able to do it for all 15 minutes was just insane. Like, yeah. who, who who can do that? Her output was just as good in the 15th minutes as it was in the first minute. Uh, she throws hard calf kicks. So those are all the things she did good. I don't know where those are. If they were all, you know, if there's a video game, they're at 10, what, what are they at now? Is is the output at a six? Is the output at a four? You know, I don't know. This one, I think, of the four fights in a row that she's fighting, I think this one will will tell the most because on the feet, that's where if 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 she's lost an advantage on the feet to Mackenzie Dern, then those numbers are really low. Mm-hmm. You know, um, because like a year ago, this would have been a terrible stylistic matchup for yeah. Mackenzie Dern. Uh, she's always been just kind of has always been very hittable, even you know, when she was the champion. You know, it's because she kept her hands low, marched forward, you know, so she was always that was always a thing, but she had the durability. Now she's starting to struggle with speed too. She struggled with the speed of Blanchfield, struggled with the speed of Jan Shannon. Uh, I'm obviously worried about her chin, as you mentioned, because you know, she has smoked in you know, three fights in a row, but like the, trashed, knocked out, you know. She, even like Whaley Zhang, I mean, the, the, when she lost the title, she was knocked out. Now that was a long time ago, but that that's that's other damage she's taken. Um, you know, you wonder her lack of defense has it, you know has it finally t- taken that ultimate toll on her durability, I and mean, that seems to be the case. Uh, due to her very heavy boxing style, she's always been open to calf kicks. Like you can kick her legs. And I don't expect Mackenzie Turner to do that, but. I'm assuming she can still wrestle. We haven't seen her wrestle. She's always had quick entries, really strong, grab a leg, toss her, you know, when she's on top, really mean, grab out. Super, super, like, like ferociousness in her that she has. That, that It's not taught. You need the heavy to don't. Uh, but the concern is she's been submitted in two of her last three fights. So that's a real serious concern, considering on paper she's now going against the best grapple she's ever faced. Pure grappler, you know. Uh, Mackenzie Dern, she's <laughs> we talk about her being opposite of just under the big thing is she's a minus athlete, she's she's not a good athlete. Yep. Uh, her striking is improved, but it's still very slow. She, she does have more power than she gets credited, um, but it's you know still not what she wants. You know, if this is a boxing match, I, I still feel better about Jessica Andrade. I think, <laughs> I think, I hope. Uh, I shouldn't say hope, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Like, like, I, I, well, yeah, no, I do hope. I like, I hope her skill on the feet is still better than Mackenzie Dern. Because if it's not, then 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 she's just a completely shot fighter. Uh, now she's going back to Dern. She's obviously the the best female jujitsu practitioner ever in UFC, the entire UFC uh, female division. The issue is, is she's such a weak offensive wrestler. I mean, you can sub everyone you want and have this crazy flexibility and everything, but she can't get the fight to the ground. She she doesn't have the best entries. She tries to grab singles and run the pipe, but she's just not that good at it. Her her best bet is to like pull guard, imaginary roll, do something like that. Now, if it, the fight hits the ground, I mean, all bets are off. I mean, she's a five time BJJ world champion. Uh, if she's on top, smothering control, slick, slick back take. She give her a little opportunity. She can take you back. Uh, she can if she, you get you know if you play the guard game. She can sweep you. 
great flexibility to kind of hit subs in all these weird positions of weird scrambles. And, and she already has seven submission wins. I'm going with the upset. I'm going to go with Andrade. I st- I still think she's the better striker. She sh- I, I'm still assuming she's going to have a power advantage. I think Dern struggles to get Andrade down. I still believe Andrade can sprawl and brawl our way to victory. If she loses this fight, she's shot. And it's not a diss on Mackenzie Dern. It's just this was always the perfect style sleep matchup for her. If she loses this one, it's over for her. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say there's still some life in there. I'm gonna say Jessica Andrade wins the decision. All right. For those keeping track at home, that is three upsets in three main card fights so far for Keith. Uh, <laughs> Here we go. Let's go fight. Yeah. Let's do all five. That brings us to the co-main event of UFC 295, a scheduled five rounds for the interim heavyweight title between Sergei Pavlovich and Tom Aspinall. Pavlovich, the 31-year-old Russian, is 18-1 overall. He is 6-1 in the UFC after dropping his uh, UFC debut to Alistair Overeem by first round uh, ground and pound. He has rattled off six straight wins over Marcelo Golm, Maurice Green, Shamil Abdurakimov, Derek Lewis, Tai Tuivasa, and Curtis Blades. The most recent of those, the Blades win, was in the headliner of UFC Fight Night 222 back in April. Pavlovich had been scheduled to be the backup for the Jones versus Miacic undisputed title bout. Once Jones was no longer able to compete, Again, that news came out on October 25th. Uh, Miacic was pulled from the card entirely. Pavlovich was left on, and Aspinall got the call. Uh, Aspinall, 30-year-old Brit uh, from Manchester. He is 13-3 and overall. He is also 6-1 and in the UFC. Uh, he is coming in off a win. Uh, very famously, of course, he headlined UFC London last July against Blades. The fight ended in like 15 seconds when Aspinall suffered a catastrophic knee injury. The talk abounded over whether he would be anything resembling the same fighter when he came back, whether he would come back at all. He reassured us that the answer was yes in both cases. And uh, he fought this July, almost a year to the day from that fight against Blades, took on Marcin Tybura, blew him away in just a minute and 13 seconds to announce that uh, he had not gone anywhere, at least competitively speaking. That was back in July. So while the call-up he gets here is on short notice, it is not exactly on a short turnaround. It's actually slightly surprising that he didn't already have a fight scheduled for early next year. But uh, in he comes. Your favorite on this one is minus 120. Your underdog plus 100, dead even money. Keith, who are they? I, I have no idea. Oh man, negative one twenty and what was it? Plus one ten, one, pl- plus one hundred, just even plus money. Yeah. Wow. Just don't even make it, like Vegas. Just make it, pick them. Oh man, I have no idea. This is the this is the toughest one to pick. I think. I see. I mean, I, I just these guys are so good right now and such scary individuals that it's it's hard to imagine one of them being an underdog to any man walking earth right now (laughs) you know Uh, i think of what you know the power that's the run that i'm 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 I'm, I'm rambling right now like i'll say i'll say pavlovich is a favorite Keith takes another L. Your <laughs> favorite is Tom Aspinall, who is okay. uh, available at minus 120, Sergey Pavlovich, plus 100. The line is super tight. That may move in the six days between now and fight night. It may be a dead pick by then. It may have flipped. But as of right now, Aspinall is just the slightest of favorite in wow. that you can find Pavlovich at plus money. You cannot find Aspinall plus money. That's it, man. That close. Yeah. It's Dude, hard to- it's hard imagining Pavlovich being like the run he is on right now, being an underdog to anybody. But but I get it. I like ask someone else is still at. These guys are two freight trains that clearly were on a collision course 
it's coming earlier than we expected, but it wouldn't have been surprising at all if Pavlovich was first up for whoever won between between Jones and Miacic, or if both those guys retired, these guys were fighting for the undisputed title early next year. This was bound to happen sooner or later. There are certain broad strokes in common about them. They are 30 and 31 years old, respectively, which is spring chickens <laughs> by heavyweight standards. Right. We're still in the middle of very much a a youth movement. I, I mean, in five years ago, half of the heavyweight top 10 was pushing 40 and in some cases over 40 and oh, yeah. there just seemed to be almost nobody coming up to change that it was just going to be junior dos santos and <laughs> alistair overeem and daniel cormier just fighting each other That's forever right. uh like until they were 60 years old and all of a sudden like andre alaski yeah yeah <laughs> And our loss, he's still in the UFC. Yeah. Uh, but thankfully, he's no longer in the title picture. These guys have come along and also in, just in broad strokes, I not since Brock Lesnar have there been heavyweights in the UFC who are this big and this nimble. Like, yeah. they just, yeah. they don't move like 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", 265-pound guys are meant to move. Yeah, that's good. Have, yeah. Uh, I know that Francis Ngannou just went and came close to shocking the world in a boxing match and shocked anybody who was actually watching that oh, boxing absolutely. match and not just reading the <laughs> yeah. headlines. Yeah. I mean, the way Sergei Pavlovich moves and the extent to which he is a boxer, you don't think he's looking at that and being like, I am just as big as Francis Ngannou. I might not hit quite as hard, but I hit close enough to make no difference, and I'm a much niftier technical boxer. You don't think he's looking over there and saying, dude, I'm going to get some money when I'm done with this MMA thing. Is it is there like a, uh, a Russian boxer that that fits the, you know, like you could do a Russia, Russia, like, you know, like who's, I know, well, I know Tyson Fury's not American. Well, but, but, uh, but Alexander Usyk was supposed to fight Fury next. And he's a know? Russian guy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, like, it shows you how much I follow boxing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then Aspinall, I, again, not – and I I am at risk for being hyperbolic here, but he already looks a bit like Frank Mir, and not since Frank Mir dropped into the UFC like 20 years ago has there been a guy with that much bulk who was just that nimble and fluid on the ground. Like, I'm not saying – well, Frank Verdum, Mir is the, the, no, no Verdum. Well, that's this is literally what I was going to say. I'm oh, not right. saying Mir's a better grappler than Verdum. Verdum is I, I, he's my pick for the greatest heavyweight grappler of all time between yeah, MMA, yeah. gi, and no gi accomplishments. Yeah, but too. but Mir was different. The thing Joe Silva always said he he moves like a lightweight on the ground. Like Aspinall has a little bit of just that nimbleness. Like yeah, uh, yeah Mayor scramble with the Nagara when he broke his arm was was incredible. Yeah. Just uh, I guess another incredible grappler. Uh twenty years ago, this might have been just a straightforward striker against grappler contest, but obviously it's more complex than that. Uh it was easy to laugh at Pavlovich getting worked by Alistair Overeem in his uh UFC debut, but you know what? One, you and I both think Overeem's uh, wrestling might be the most underrated single skill in MMA oh, history. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. he's the yeah. K1, you know, yeah. the kickboxing <laughs> champ, the knockout artist, the deadly. Yeah. No, this dude was an incredible offensive wrestler and had That's some right. savage ground and pound. And That's you know right. what? Pavlovich learned it the hard way. By a year later, I don't think Overeem repeats that against him. Pavlovich no. learned from his mistake and became different. Uh, and then Aspinall, yeah, obviously he's a grappler. His dad was the jujitsu coach at Team Kaabon. It's another similarity between him and Mir. Like his dad was his first coach, and like mm -hmm. has stayed his coach forever. Uh, but Aspinall's like point me to the fight where Aspinall got outstruck. It's it's <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's not exactly. like yeah. yeah, it's not like he's this like stumble bum who's going for desperation takedowns because no. everybody's lighting him up. No, he's got fast hands and great power. Like. He's yeah. huge and like just, uh, you know, the, the the reach he has on his uh, punches as well as kicks, he makes full use of it. So it's more complex than just an old school matchup of styles. I've gone back and forth on this one so many times because 
it's one of those fights where both guys have so much momentum and have looked so dominant, even as they've worked their way up the rankings. Uh, Pavlovich has answered all the questions that you would want to ask about a, a, a future champ. There, it's always the the Conor McGregor thing. Well, let's wait until he fights a wrestler because you know after the Overeem fight, Pavlovich was fighting guys that were badly overmatched and probably would have preferred to strike with him anyway. Like I know Maurice Green would have liked to, to have taken him down, but that just wasn't happening. Pavlovich is 10 times the athlete, mm -hmm. but you know, his best wins until the blades fight, Lewis and Tuivasa were guys that wanted to strike and Pavlovich was better at it. But Curtis blades is still probably the best wrestler in the history of heavyweight MMA. And one of the very best right now. And Pavlovich was up to the task. I, because of that, it, I, I believe Aspinall is going to be able to get him to the ground at some point in the fight, but I don't know if it's going to be on his first try. And I don't know what things are going to look like for him until he gets that. Like I, Aspinall hasn't faced a striker like Pavlovich, at least not one who was able, who was going to be able to keep his feet. Like Alexander Volkov is a very good striker. Andre Arlovsky, mm. even in 2021, was still a good boxer, but neither of those guys was good, was able to stay on their feet against Aspinall. He, like, blew through him. Yeah. Uh, Aspinall, I mean, he's not Blades in terms of amateur background, certainly not in terms of what he's actually accomplished in MMA yet, but in terms of just the raw skills, uh, he might have the second fastest, uh, like, second best double leg outside of... Uh, blades that I've seen in the heavyweight division in, in, in years. Like he's a good wrestler. And then obviously once he gets uh, fights to the ground, brutal ground and pound, graded advancing position, uh, equally happy to take the back and choke somebody out. And again, just nimble in moving from position to position or, you know, equally happy to just keep punching them until th they go out. Like I could go on like this and just like convince myself of one fighter over the other, uh, you know, for another 15 minutes, I'm not going to subject our listeners to that. They want to hear your analysis anyway, but <laughs> give me, give me Aspinall by submission. I'm going to say it happens in round four after an epic first couple of rounds where there are multiple swings of momentum. One or both guys get hurt on the feet. Maybe Aspinall has real trouble taking Pavlovich down early, or maybe he gets him down, and we think this is going to be a real quick fight, and then Pavlovich shows how much he's improved. But I think there's going to be a great fight. Uh, but with everything being so equal, I'm still old school enough that I, I, I lean ever so slightly towards the ground fighter. Give me Aspinall by round four submission. Man, the, the way you were breaking down at first, I thought you were taking Pavlovich. Um Ask me tomorrow, I might. Yeah, you asked me so one minute from now, I might be switching but, my picks. But but if Pavlovich wins, I think it's in the first seven or eight minutes of the fight. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, like if Aspinall <laughs> can't even keep him honest with takedown attempts, I think Pavlovich hurts him quickly. And yeah, yeah. Um, this is this is as good of a heavyweight fight as I can remember. Mm -hmm. That you know, I'm not saying it's going going to be as good, but I mean. When I think about fights between heavyweights where I was this excited, I don't know. Like, <laughs> Kotor is O2. Like, I, I, I mean, <laughs> right now, like 80% of the list is like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you know? Um, let, let I, I, me throw let me throw one thing out real quick. I mean, anyone listening to our show right now, they know they're in for a three hour show. So let me throw this out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, we, we we lost Jones versus Miacic, right? Yeah. If they had made Jones versus Miacic in 2019, like say right after oh Miacic beat Cormier for the second time. Oh my gosh. That's like right after Miacic beat Cormier for the second time, right before Jones fought uh, Reyes, where. Like agree, some okay. holes were starting yeah, yeah. to like sure, sure. That would have been maybe the oh, biggest fight ever. The biggest be, like it would have felt like the, ever. Yeah. And even if it wasn't in terms of like ticket 
and pay-per-view sales, that would have been the best heavyweight fight in MMA history. What about before Stipe lost to DC? Where no, because Stipe was a you know most people didn't expect him to lose that first fight. Yeah, you know when he was on that run, you know he just beat Francis and Ghana. I don't know who John Jones was fighting at the time, but say that's you know say that's around the Anthony Smith, give or take. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> I mean, to me, the the, the fight would have felt about equal either way it would have been interesting to see how the predictions and the lines would have changed mm -hmm. but anywhere from you know kind of 2018 to 2019 when they were both just at the peak of their powers that would have been the bit yeah it would have been the heavyweight version of gsp versus silva where if you can make this while these two guys are in their prime in adjacent divisions you, you fucking do it which is why credit to Alexander um, Volkanovsky. Yeah, Volkanovsky and Makashev for willing to take those chances. And DC. DC yeah. stepping up and, and, and Stevie at that time. Um dude, what a fight, man. What like this is this is the best fight they can make in the division. And that's it is. not just in John Jones. That's not like no. like don't get me wrong. You throw take one of these guys out, throw John Jones in. I'm just as excited. Yeah. Take one of these guys out, throw Francis Zagano in. It. Yeah, you yeah. know, <laughs> I'm just as excited. But um I think. I think I might favor these guys over either of them off the cuff. Like no, no study. Yeah, yeah. I it, it's hard to favor anybody over John Jones because you, it's hard to pick. Again, even though I have in the past when I picked against John Jones one time, I looked like a fool. But uh, <laughs> it's hard to to pick someone over John Jones because we've never seen him lose. Yeah. With all respect to Matt Hamill, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it's it's hard to imagine a way he loses. But it's becoming as he's getting older and fighting less frequently. It's in, uh, it's becoming a little easier to imagine. Yeah, he looked he looked human in his last couple fights at light heavyweight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I thought he lost to Dark Race. Mm -hmm. So, man, I I, I just wanted to, I don't want to just jump right to these guys' skill. I just want to say like it's a, it's a great fight. It, it's I I. I'm also not – I don't remember being this torn about a heavyweight fight. Like, I've had fights where I was really on the fence. Like, I, I think – I remember, like, Sean Shirk versus BJ Penn. Like, that seemed like a super fight at that time. And, yeah. and while well, the outcome was all BJ, but I was always like, yeah, BJ's great, but, you know, not motivated. The wrestler, like, Matt Hughes type, like, you know, and there was those questions of being on the fence. And uh, I remember – St. Pierre BJ too, you know, that when they fought the second time and, and stuff, but heavyweight, I don't remember being ever this on the fence. I, I wasn't this on the fence of Feeder and Crow Cup. <laughs> you yeah. know, I was, I was old. I was old. I thought Feeder was going to kill him. Yeah. Um, so that's how great, that's how great this fight is. I, 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 to me, this feels like the main event. You know, Tom Aspinall is this massive heavyweight, six foot five. He's long and lengthy. He's well rounded. That's the thing that jumps out to me. Like, yeah, he's this ground specialist, but he's so good on the feet too. I mean, in fairness, he hasn't been starching the guys on the feet that Pavlovich has. Like, there's a different, uh, you know, the guys he's flashing his his stand up skills a little different, but he's extremely athletic. He he moves like a welterweight. Great footwork, cuts angles well. Constantly switching stances to get his opponents guessing. The fast hands. Explosive, accurate. He's got KO power in both hands. He mixes his striking and takedowns together really well. Uh, really good on the ground. I mean, he smashed Sergey Pavlovich with ground and pound, and he just subs everybody quick with ease. Andre Olowski with ease. Alexander Volkov with ease. Um, you know, I know, I know. I think it was ground and pound against Tabor, but it was after starching him. You know, hurt him clubbing. Sub, I mean, clubbing. I don't know what the <laughs> Not club and more club. <laughs> club and continue clubbing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, if I hits the ground, the guy's the guy's a wizard. He really is. Uh, Pavlovich, I mean, you're talking about another great athlete in the division. He, he he's a power puncher who's also technical. Uh, he's fast hands, very accurate. Like you know, people talk about his power, but they don't talk about his accuracy because you still have to land the shots. You know, people talk about all the. You know, oh, he knocks on one one minute. He's the power. You can still land that clean shot in that minute. So, 
uh, he's, he's, yeah, he works by like it's a power jab. Straight shots. I mean, his straight follow up shots are devastating. Might be the hardest hitter in the game. I mean, and, and I mean that with all due respect to Francis Ngannou, who who just dropped Tyson Fury. So, so I said might because uh, until I see him drop Tyson Fury, and I know it's boxing, but still, <laughs> you drop Tyson Fury with those big gloves. I, I still might have to give that to Francis, but. I mean, his, his, his straight right is incredible. His his left hook is, is like a weapon of mass destruction. He doesn't he doesn't slip uppercut, which is so rare but effective for him. He he works very fast right out the gate. You know, goes goes right to his rhythm, right to his pace. You know, fearless in that way. He's not no failing out. He has fifteen first round knockouts in his career. I mean, he's got six first round knockouts in a row in the UFC at the highest level you know, organization. I mean, the dude, it, you know, I joke about it, but the dude is a real life Ivan Drago. <laughs> you know, he touches you, you're going out. Uh, and he's got a great chin because, you know, I think about some of the exchanges he's had with guys before he puts them out. He's swinging and he's he's getting tagged back. I mean, I, I always go back to that two of us fight where they're both opening up on each other and he was eating shots in two of us. He wasn't even flinching. He was still stepping in with his own power shots and finishing the job and seeing what he was doing. Uh, you know, on the feet, the one he doesn't throw, he doesn't really throw kicks. He's not a kicker. Uh, he hasn't wrestled too much in the UFC, but he he was a decent wrestler and, and fight night global offensively. Defensively, you always bring up the Alistair Overeem fight. I mean, that's a tough fight. UFC debut fighting a guy like Alistair Overeem in like a weird country and all kinds of like it was, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't want to read too much into that. And then he, he did stuff a takedown attempt from Curtis Blades in their fight, but it was one. Stuff takedown, which which might be all he needs, if, but you know I, I don't want to swing the pendulum too much either way. Where I'm, I, I I've have no confidence in his takedown defense because of over him or supreme confidence he stopped one takedown against Curtis Blades. Uh, and he also he also isn't a submission threat. This is an incredible matchup. I mean, I love both of these guys. We you know you talk you know last week with with Francis Ngano and Tyson Fury. You, you talk about who's the baddest man ever. You know, you, you know, you know, walking the face of the earth. That that saying, you know, your mom always said, you know, someone tougher than you out there. You know, you know, obviously, I tossed John Jones' name in that. These two guys might be battling for that crown. Like that's that's how bad these two guys. I the only thing I wish about this fight, one, I wish it was a main event, and it just it, it doesn't seem like it should be under any fight. But also, I, I just wish both guys had a full camp for this. Sure. Um, Oof, that just gave me an idea about something. Because, <laughs> I mean, because Asmol didn't have a full camp, but did Pavlich have a full camp? I mean, he was training to be the backup, right? Yeah, you know, but not, I don't well, think he, I don't, for Aspinall, but full camp just in general. Yeah, I mean, he he knew he had to be under 265 pounds and presumably yeah. able to fight. Yeah. Um, I mean, heavyweight's a little different. It was other weight class, and you, you're not really cutting weight and, um, they might have to, some of these guys might have to cut a couple bit, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And, and they don't fight at a pace where they really get to gas out that much. I mean, they they gas out, but you know what I'm saying. Like the output output is usually not the thing at heavyweight. Um, man, I know whoever I pick, I'm picking wrong. <laughs> like I just I just know I'm getting this fight wrong. I, I mean, feel pa- the exact same way. <laughs> Pavlich has the power. I mean. But the, you mentioned it, the longer the fight goes on, the more I start to favor Aspinall. And the one thing that keeps jumping out about Aspinall is he has two avenues for victory. Like, if, if Aspinall just caught Pavlovich and put him out, I think it's at least like, you know, less likely than Pavlovich catching him with a one shot. But, like, it's not in the realm it, of it's possibility. Not, it's not Gabriel Gonzaga kicking Crow Cup. Yeah, no, no. It's, it's not in the realm of possibility. If he, yeah. he opens up with a four punch combination, 10 seconds of the fight, and puts him out. I'd been like, holy shit, like this guy's incredible. But it, it would be like, oh my gosh, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh man, I still don't that 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 power is an equalizer, you know. That's the it's hard to to ignore that because when you fight a guy like Pavlich, you gotta be perfect. Really? Yep. <sighs> I'm going to go with your pick. I'm going to say Aspel somehow weathers in the storm. I think Pavlich is going to come out throwing those bombs and he's going to weather them. Uh, maybe he closes the distance immediately and gets to a clinch and kind of like tries to wear out his arms or something like that. 
But I think he eventually fights, gets the fight to the ground. I think Pavlich might might slow down a little bit. And I, I think I'm going to go a little earlier than you. I'm going to say he does catch a sub. I'm going to say he does in the second round. I'm going to say Aspinall subs in the second round. All right. That is two picks for Tom Aspinall to be your new interim UFC heavyweight champion with a extreme amount of recognition of the other possibilities in this fight. Let me ask this question real quick. I know we went really long on that fight, but who does the UFC want to win? Espinal. I don't know. I I, I don't think there's a, a real bad choice there. Like, they're... <laughs> Let me ask you this question. And, and I mean, I don't know if we, we'll ever see him fight again, but who does John Jones want to win? <laughs> Pavlovich. I'm going to disagree. I'm going to disagree on that one. I don't know if I want to fight Sergey Pavlovich. I mean, Sergey, Sergey Pavlovich knocks out Tom Aspinall in a minute. <laughs> Ain't many people signed that contract. I I agree. And for, for, again, for what it's worth, we are like a, as hesitant as I am to say a fighter quit or broke or whatever. I am even slower to say one fighter is scared of another. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Least of all. That. John Jones. John Jones, but yeah. I'm just yeah. if if I'm John Jones and I'm like, okay, I'm 36 years old. Yeah, I yeah. want to fight one more time. I want a win bonus, and if possible, I want to go out on top. Yeah, John Jones thinks he can beat both these guys. Like, don't don't of question course. that for a moment. But he probably think to me thinks Pavlovich is a slightly Could easier be. day at the office. That's all I yeah. would say. Yeah, we'll we'll talk more about that in the recap show. Where do recap and yeah. fights? <laughs> With that, we come to the main event. A light heavyweight title fight between Yuri Prohaska and Alex Pereira. Prohaska, the 31-year-old Czech, is 29-3-1 overall. He's 3-0 in the UFC and on a 13-fight win streak overall. He has not fought since last June, where he uh, won the UFC title with a fifth-round submission of Glover Teixeira in one of the greatest title fights in UFC history, Absolutely. probably the greatest uh, light heavyweight title fight oh, yeah. of all time, which is saying a hell of a lot considering what a storied division that is. Yeah. Uh, he had been scheduled to defend his title that fall, but uh, got injured in November, a severe shoulder injury and Prohaska being the guy he is uh, rather than forcing the UFC to mint an interim belt simply relinquished the title. Uh, that's just uh, a guy who's all about Bushido and honor, kind of putting his money where his mouth is. Uh, but at any rate, he's back, and he's back taking on a guy who was barely a blip on the radar at the time in the form of Pereira. 36-year-old Brazilian is 8-2 and two overall. He's 5-1 and one in the UFC, a run that saw him capture the uh, UFC middleweight title with a shocking fifth round knockout of Israel Adesanya last November. Uh, he lost the title to Adesanya in his next fight, declared his intention to move up to 205 pounds and made his debut at UFC 291 in July, taking a narrow decision over former light heavyweight champ, Jan Blachowicz. That was good enough to get him the call here. He is also a new inductee as of this week into the Glory Kickboxing Hall of Fame. So congrats to Poetan on that one. All right, Keith, you are eight and three on the night so far in picking uh, I'm, the I'm favorites here. That. I'm pleased with that. Your favorite here is minus 120. Your okay. uh, underdog is even money plus 100. Who okay. are they? Uh, Prohaska is a favorite. Keith goes out on a sour note as your favorite <laughs> is Alex Pereira minus 120. Yuri Prohaska plus 100. I should have started off when I was like 4 and 0. I should have stopped. I've been pretty <laughs> mediocre the rest of the way. Uh, pretty solid, man. On a card with this many close lines, again, only three of the 12 fights tonight have a greater than 2 to 1 favorite. <laughs> Going 8 and 4 isn't bad. We should uh, do this. We should do this in the future when it's like, oh, uh, yeah, uh, Ilya Tapori got hurt and uh, UFC newcomer just got brought in. Uh, 
uh, the favorites negative six hundred. Keith, who who's the favorite? <laughs> no, dude, we'll do this for like a Bellator prelim. Yeah. Your your favorite is minus sixteen hundred. Uh, yeah. Your underdog plus eleven fifty on the comeback. <laughs> what, like it's Tyrell Fortune against a one and one guy. I guess like... <laughs> AJ McKee versus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something I that struck me about this. This is almost a, a throwback to the days when the UFC was not quite the dominant force that it is right now. Look at these two fighters. Like, Prohaska versus Pereira, it, you know, it took a little weaving to get here, but this doesn't feel undeserved for either of these guys. Uh, Pereira is a recent middleweight champ who beat a former champ in yeah. his first fight at light heavyweight. Yeah. Title shot makes sense. Prohaska sure. is a former champ who you know, was forced out with a, an injury and almost anybody else would still be the lineal champ right now. Yeah. And it still, it seems but, like a title defense but, for him. But having said that, Prosca has three UFC fights. Yeah. Pereira has six, but you know, <laughs> he won the title in, in his, well, his fourth. Like yeah, it, it's rare to have a fight this high stakes between yeah. two guys with this little UFC experience. It, it, it is a throwback to, when the UFC wasn't really the only show on, yeah, on, yeah. on earth. And it, it, it's funny. You, you said that it's his six, had a six fight in the UFC. This is his third title fight. Yeah. Dude, you want to hear something wild? Yuri Prohaska hasn't lost a fight since King Mo knocked him out on New Year's Eve, 2015. That's crazy. Dude, this is how long ago that is. Not only was Alex Pereira not in the UFC yet, neither of his kickboxing fights with Israel Adesanya had happened yet. Yeah, that's crazy. That's like, crazy. That's Alex Pereira's yeah. whole career has taken place since the last time Yuri Prohaska lost yeah, a fight. that's a Leon Edwards type streak right there. That's, that, that's impressive. It, it is. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's almost refreshing. And, and I, I'm not a UFC hater or a UFC shill. Like, I dislike yeah. some of their business practices. Sure. I like that now that they're the only, like almost the only option for top level fighters, we very rarely don't get to see a fight that we want to see. That's, that's the, like people, Generally people, speaking, yeah. you know, obviously the, the big story was the UFC taking over pride in 2007. But after that, the UFC still didn't have a monopoly on talent. It wasn't until strike force and IFL in like 2010, 2011, that okay at this point 80 percent of the top 10 fighters in the in the sport yeah. are on ufc roster yeah um so it's just yeah it's kind of cool Prasca rose almost to the pinnacle of the sport fighting in ryzen uh yeah. pereira stepped in out of kickboxing and just immediately started lamping good mma fighters yeah so yeah. refreshing in that way that's just kind of my little side rant about uh how cool this is yeah perhaps it was a little bit right place right time Going, mm -hmm. kind of going out like it was it was a you know there was no guys in the division that was really standouts. John Jones left the division at the you know so it was kind of wide open. Pajeda got rushed because of his history with Adesanya, but obviously it was what he's done is deserved. Yeah, I mean I, he's got a knockout of the middleweight champion right now, and an easy knockout of the middleweight champion yeah. right now made it look and easy. He, yeah, no, absolutely, and. Uh, I mean, this fight obviously makes sense because it's not like Prohaska and Teixeira hated each other. They're two of the more genial guys in the sport. But, you know, uh, Teixeira's star student uh, trying to get the title back and bring it back to Connecticut uh, <laughs> yeah. is, is kind of a, a cool side story. Yeah. It's interesting. There's something about Prohaska's fight style. In some ways, like his fight style is so wild and so aggressive that you almost you almost think it, it had to take some kind of luck for him to go on a thirteen fight unbeaten streak. Like if he hadn't gotten to the title picture as quickly mm -hmm. as he did, it, somebody would have made him pay for it at some point. Sure. He, he would have taken a bad loss. It, it's all that's unfair to say to him because he's not a slightly refined Johnny Walker. Like that's what I feel my that's how I feel about someone like Johnny Walker. Like, you know, he's yeah. too wild. He'll never string together enough wins to yeah. But even before he got to the UFC, Prohaska was beating good fighters in in Ryzen. Like not world beaters, but if he was really that 
sloppy and anybody might take advantage of them on, on any given night, someone like Carl Albertson or Bruno Capaloza or Brandon Halsey, like would have done it. Sure. Uh, I think he's a guy that's just, it's always going to be a wild fire fight, whether he's fighting a lower level fighter or a high level fighter. Like, uh, he had a wild firefight with Vulcan Uzdemir. Like the first, his first round against Vulcan Uzdemir, it was a hell of a fight. It was my round of the year for 2020, but it didn't look like a guy who was going to, to me, like a guy who was going to be able to make it to. I agreed. To the, the light heavyweight title, but. Yeah, I agreed. And, and he had an, or no, all right, sorry. The, the first round against Vulcan Uzdemir was, was great. The first round against Dominic Reyes was great. Yeah, that yeah. was, yeah. And the spinning this, knockout later on yeah. the next round. Yeah. Then Teixeira, just an all timer. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. The reason the title fights are five rounds is right there. Because yeah. it could be a top 10 fight ever. Exactly. It's like, just it's that good. The one thing boxing at its best does better than MMA is give fighters enough time that there's actually a story within a fight. There are multiple swings of momentum. Uh, and, Sure. Only the best five round title fights do that. It's why we still talk about Couture versus his 01, which technically is not a modern level fight. But yeah, to share the to share fight was incredible. Here against Pereira, part of me thinks this should be an easy night at the office for him. But then, really? the, the, <laughs> well, part of me does, sure. but then part of me goes, the same defensive lapses, like if Dominic Reyes was tagging him repeatedly, cleanly, yeah, yeah. Alex Pereira it. kills somebody with those same opportunities. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I get so, it. Yeah. yeah. So the thing that I've been thinking about Yuri Prohaska for six or seven years now, I'm like, okay, is this the time that I've abandoned that train of thought, but is this the time that it would be right? Like. I suppose I should talk about the raw skills for a minute. Uh, Prohaska, gigantic, light heavyweight. We don't talk about him in the same breath as Johnny Walker, Ryan Spann, Kennedy Zetchigwu, Alex Pereira, yeah. but he is titanic. He's yeah. a conservatively yeah, he conservative 6'4", huge wingspan, long legs. Uh, while he's comfortable fighting in close, like he, you know, really enjoys unleashing long kicks, spinning stuff that... I think hits people at longer range than they're expecting him to be able to catch them at. Uh, he's actually quite comfortable on the ground. Doesn't go there by by preference, but he's no slouch on the ground. Uh, we haven't seen much of his offensive wrestling. It'd be interest. It'll be interesting to see if he tries to pursue that as an avenue to victory against uh, against Pereira. Uh, I if, if it if he does. I, I wonder, like, if he found the Blahovich fight discouraging or encouraging when, when he watches it. Uh, I, Prasca should have more tools. He does have more tools. He has three times as many professional fights as Pereira. Mm -hmm. I mean, he might not be as precise a, a kickboxer. Obviously, you know, Pereira's a super elite uh, kickboxer. But Pereira, for as elite as he is, is hittable, just you know, like be, being untouchable was never his route to victory. Even when he was in kickboxing, it, it, it hasn't been when he's been in MMA. Like, it's not like Israel Adesanya where when Adesanya beat somebody, they're swinging at air. He's coming back with like pinpoint strikes and the thing's over. You know, Pereira just counts on him on himself to come out on the better side of a firefight because of his ridiculous power. Uh, You said about the last fight, Pavlovich versus Aspinall, that whatever pick you make, you know it's going to be wrong. I'm leaning Prohaska here, and I know I'm wrong because the way I see Prohaska winning involves him walking through a lot of fire from Pereira, and I don't know if there are many humans on the planet that can do that. Yeah. Good but <laughs> I think it's going to look like Prohaska's best fight so far, where there's a barn burner of a first round. Maybe Prohaska gets the worst of it. Uh, maybe he gets slightly the better of it, but he absolutely takes some fire from Pereira. And I think he knocks him out in the second round. I, wow. As as big and powerful as Pereira is, his, like, 
his chin was like surprisingly susceptible when Adesanya finally found it. And maybe that's just the cut to middleweight. Maybe that's age 35 at the time, now 36, on the tail end of a pretty lengthy kickboxing career. But I've seen Yuri Prohaska fight offensively potent fighters before and come out on the right end of a wild yeah. fight. I'm picking him to do it here. I wouldn't be too surprised if he does try to bring this thing to the ground. And again, if he does, my only hope is that he does it as a proactive element of strategy rather than just a, a panic move because he gets rung up. But yeah, give me Prohaska to knock out Pereira in the second round here. Wow. It's a good fight. You got me excited for this fight. It, uh, it's it's funny because, you know, we, we're talking about this card and we're talking about, you know, the power of Sergey Pavlich, one of the, you know, I think it's safe to say one of the hardest hitters in the history of the sport already. <laughs> what about these two guys in the main event? You know, uh, you know, we see what Alex Bahag had done on multiple occasions to Israel Adesanya. And, and then, Yuri Prohaska, dude's got 25 wins by KO, you know, which and, we don't talk about enough. Yeah. I know uh, Lev always talks about that. Lev, I think Lev ranked Yuri is, is like the number one knockout artist ever. Which, nah. I mean, he's not the first person you'd think of, but numerically, there's an he argument. Has a ton of knockouts. And yeah, that's, yeah, and like, he, he's I, knocked I, out I, good people. And when he knocks him out, it's there, it, there's no question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought I thought it was a little bit of a like absurd statement at the time, but then when you dig into it, and again, I'm I'm, I'm disagreeing with it because of you know Francis Gano and, and and Derek Lewis, and but it's, it's not ridiculous, you know, it's not. So, uh, you know, your process is super athletic. You know, uh, it's not many people could say they were more athletic than Dominic Reyes in a fight. You know, that the, yeah. the, they did something spectacular, you know, at some spectacular athletic feat, and it wasn't Dominic Reyes, you know. I, I think flow, you know, flowing is the best way to describe his movement. He just flows. Constantly switches stances. Uh, he's good in both stances. He has this very unorthodox style where it's, it's, it's you can't time it because it's so unusual, kind of herky-jerky a little bit. Like, like if Keith Jardine was a good athlete <laughs> – you know, like <laughs> what Keith Jardine would do, but like if he had some athleticism in him, you know, uh, and, and a lot of his movements is distract you. You don't know what's coming. And then suddenly he, you know, he darts at you with a big shot, very like your well Romero style where low, 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 then huge. He does all that movement just to kind of dart in and, and, and land strikes. Dude can absolutely crack him. We just mentioned it. 25 wins by knockout. Uh, it's because he really sits on his punch and generates power with his feet underneath him, you know, like his legs there. Uh, like how he just walked down Vulcan Ustamir with, with power shots in his UFC debut. I love that he blasts the body. Now, he is open to leg kicks. Uh, it's been a while ago. Well, it's not that while. It's only four fights ago. But, like, C.B. Dalloway was having success kicking his legs out, of all people. You know, I think I don't really know for his kicks. Uh, not much of an offensive wrestler really ever though to his credit he did take dominic reyes down and briefly in that fight um, but his takedown defense on the flip side is god awful uh glover to share who's going to be in the corner of alex Pajeda. i mean he, but glover share is an underrated wrestler of all time you know yeah. like he's such a good wrestler but i mean it looked like bo nickel out there like he was taking him down with at will but the reason why he had to take him down is he was hard to hold down. Prasaska did very well, and that was a difference in the fight. Is most people get taken down by Glover Teixeira, and it's a wrap, <laughs> you know, as as Yamalovitz. But that wasn't the case with Yuri Prohaska. He made the at that time the champion Glover Teixeira work for everything he could do. Uh, and, and then on top of that, he caught Glover Teixeira in a submission. Now, he does have three submissions on his record. I, I don't view him as a submission artist, and I I do think. Catching Glover Sharon was more about fatigue and, and 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 being a little lucky and him kind of having a mental lapse for a second, but that's still of a hell of an accomplishment, regardless regardless if it was luck and in and, and great opportunity, but but still. Now, 
Alice Pahea, you know, thinking about him, you know, I, I saw him in New York last year and <laughs> I'm making this like this joke when he moved to light heavyweight in my head. If God, you know, he'd be like, oh, if God could come down to you and he can answer three questions, you know, my first question would be like, yeah, God, what's what's the meaning of life? <laughs> you know, you know, second one, uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> I don't know. You know, my third question would be, how the hell did Alex Pahara make middleweight? <laughs> like, the dude is humongous. He, he, yeah, he walks around a hotel and it just, it's a presence that you just, it's different. Do it as biggest men would have ever seen. Uh, obviously, he's an incredible striker. Slowly mo- marching down his foes, explosive hands, fast, fast hands, um, accurate, uh, really short, tight shots. Not a lot of, not a lot of tells. Um, is his left hook should should be illegal? I mean, that's how good it is. I mean, look, ask Sean Strickland. Oh. <laughs> you know about the ask ask. Uh, it, you know, we think about the second knockout, but against Izzy, yeah, it wasn't as spectacular. That first knockout, Izzy, in, in their uh, in their second kickboxing match, I mean, incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, he has so much power because I mean, one is his huge legs, but he keeps he keeps his base underneath him. Uh, he's one of these guys. I've said this before. that has been super. He's he can strike well back it up. He just stops on a dime and lands, just walks you right into shots. Uh, has great. Leg kicks. I mean, you go back to that it, it, the first is India on an MMA fight where Izzy would, was, you know, it's kind of saying like he wasn't hurt with the punches. It was actually the calf kicks that was really bothering him. Now, he does he does have almost like an overconfidence in his chin though. Like he keeps his chin high, he drops his hands. I mean, that's what cost him. You know, he kind of opened up and and you know kept his chin as a high target for Izzy to catch in, in, in their rematch. Uh, you do have to worry about his durability due to his long running kickboxing, being knocked out by Idia Sanya, and also his age. He's thirty six. Like he's not a spring. I mean, we think about him being, you know, only six fights in, in the UFC. I think it's like nine fights total in MMA. But it, this little bit of like a what we talked about, like a Marco Matsu coming over. Like not not the extent of Marco Matsu. You get my point. Like he, he's not young, yeah. so it, being that he's a power puncher who, who who you know big thing of his is just his explosion if he loses that at all and loses a little bit of durability with a guy like prohaska you're talking about that's huge now i like i like his offensive plump clinch if he, if he goes to the plump clinch where he's controlling he's really good you know big knees and size the major problem is if when it's defensive on like young Paul always made it defensively he has a major hole in his defensive wrestling uh I mean, Adesanya took him down in the first fight pretty easily. And Adesanya obviously is not known for his wrestling. Though I, th- I do think it's a little slightly over, uh, underrated, but still. Uh, and the and bigger thing is he struggled to get back up to his feet. You know, he did that happen with Blahovitz. But eventually, due to size, he does get back up. And another concern I have with him is cardio. I mean, cardio is an issue. Uh, he he was, you know, he won that fight against Mount Blahovitz, but he slowed down. I mean, it was a really slow pace for for majority of that fight. There's a lot of like intangibles in this fight that makes this fight so intriguing. To me, there's going to be a lot of questions answered. You know, one is what are the effects of Yuri's injury? I mean, if it's an injury that I mean, I'm not obviously I'm not a doctor, but it was some shoulder injury that put him out where he had to vacate the title and be out for a year. Does that make him a little bit slower? You know, does it make his punches? Not as hard. Like I don't, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it makes it better. Who knows? Maybe it's something that needed to be fixed and it'd be even better. But it's still a question we got to answer. And Yuri's not getting a warm up. Like he's getting thrown right to the wolves. Like the best of the best, the top guy, right away. You know, um, we got to ask Paya, Has he improved his takedown defense at all since his last fight? Has his cardio gotten better? Being that's his second fight in the division, you know, has his got his diet a little bit? Like you know, that has that changed? Um, some other factors like you know the age difference. Yuri, Yuri, even though he has all the experience, he's five years younger. You know, is is he in his prime? And is 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 Paya past his prime? Is is Glover Teixeira, who's fought Yuri Prohaska recently, his last fight? And, and had a camp for him and started having a second camp for him. What does he bring 
to the kid, you know, being in Alex's corner, does that make, you know, does that affect it? Does that help Alex? Uh, I know this is kind of stupid, but does New York City help Alex? Because, you know, Alex Perry's traveled to New York City. He's trained in New York City. I mean, he, when he won, he's, you know, he lives in Connecticut. He's only probably an hour, two hours away or maybe, maybe less. But besides that, he's been in Times Square and taken Photoshop, you know, photo on the top of the Empire State Building and all that stuff that adds in the New York City week. That didn't bother him, see, you know, against Israel Asanya. But does this bother Yuri Prohaska, who has a much different personality, who definitely laid back, you know? He was actually there in New York City because they were still promoting Glover's, the Glover to share rematch at that point. But he was a guy, and I mean, I'm not, not, I'm not saying he's a dick or anything like that, but. He doesn't seem like a guy you go up and you approach, <laughs> you know. He, he doesn't seem. And I'm not saying he's, he's a jerk, and so I want to be very clear. But just saying, he's not. It's not DC walking around smiling at everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's quiet. He's got. He had his head over his head. He's like seems. He, he seems like focused. <laughs> They're not even fighting. Fighting. You know, they were scheduled to fight like three months later. He's still like he's ready to kill somebody. So, these are all things like does does that atmosphere does that affect Yuri? You know, he doesn't seem like he's a guy that would be in Times Square trying to take pictures with people. You know, I don't know. So it's not often that Yuri should have an advantage on the ground, <laughs> you know, but in this case it is. But it's also, you know, does he have a disadvantage on the feet? I don't know. Like you're picking a Monaco, but like it, the poss- it's a possibility that he has a disadvantage on the feet, which. Is never the case, really, the case for him. So it's such a great fight. I, these are the fights I love. The last two fights I love because I love being on the fence. Like, we're not that prediction show where we're like, oh, take this to the bank, you know, I can't miss. Like, that's not us, Tim. Like, we're honest. Like, we're fans. We're like, I love this. I love being torn. I, I don't want to know the outcome, you know? The only thing I keep thinking, and it's funny because you kept thinking the same thing, is that. Yuri has always been so hittable. And you don't want to get hit by Alex Pajera. And you went the opposite way that I'm not. I'm going with that. You can't take a shot with Alex Pajera. I'm going to say Pajera plunks him. I'm going to say he does it in the second round. Give me Pajera by second round knockout. All right. I don't know who is the hardest single hitter in MMA or in all of combat sports. Well, Bo Nickel. But, but, well, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, he puts that foot on your chin and you're, you're going to Yeah, we're talking about, yeah. obviously we're talking number two. Okay. Yeah. Number two, again, overall fighters, I don't know, but I know that Alex Pereira's left hook might be the single technique I least want to be on the wrong end of. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, um, I mean, I, not to be like, <laughs> uh, do you like, a, I don't know I'm looking at, like being like super obvious, but I mean, Connor's feedback left hand was pretty freaking good. It was good uh, yeah. I mean, Dan Henderson's overhand right. Um, yeah. yeah, like Mark Hunt uppercut or left hookers, you know, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, it, it's 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 there. It's in the conversation. It is. Yeah, that is it. The Sherdog Radio Network preview for UFC 295: Prohaska versus Pereira. I have been Ben. He has been Keith. If this is your first time watching or listening to one of our previews, first of all, thank you. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, We do our best to bring you as good a mix of deep analysis and occasional side tangents as you'll find anywhere in this business. Uh, Please do like, subscribe, drop us a comment. Uh, Keith and I both man the comment section. We'd love to hear your takes on some of these fights. We've made a few upset picks on a card with no real obvious uh sharp play so we might be dead wrong on these if you think we are let us know uh but yeah do do hit the like it costs you nothing and it makes us feel real good uh, but most importantly join us for the recap we will be live on the sure dog youtube page about 10 or 15 minutes after the main event as we always are keith takes the captain's chair we will talk about all 12 of these fights in reverse order from the unbelievable top two fights all the way down to the not bad at all uh first couple 
and we'll talk about what was good, what was bad, what was surprising, what was controversial. There's always something. Uh, talk about what's next for some of the notable winners as well as losers, and we'll talk with you. The live chat on the YouTube page is open that whole time, so we're taking your questions, your comments, and your hot takes in real time. We have a growing community of friends that hang out with us after the fights, and we'd love for you to be part of it. Between now and then, thank you once again for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week, and by all means, enjoy.